6.05 on Tuesday, January 21st, and I'd like to call the meeting to order, a meeting of the Amherst School Committee to order. This meeting is being recorded on live broadcast by Amherst Media. Thank you, Amherst Media. So I'm Superintendent Mike Morris, and the reason that I'm starting the meeting and chairing the meeting is there was a recent election in the town of Amherst, and the first order of business tonight is to reorganize. Uh, my role in this is pretty limited. It's just to facilitate the committee to select a chair, once that chair is selected, they will then lead uh, the other elections for the vice chair and the secretary of the Amherst School Committee. The way this typically works is that I'll ask for nominations. Uh, while we don't have to, by Robert's Rules of Order, I typically ask if someone's willing to accept the nomination to avoid a more cumbersome process later on. Uh, and we'll, I'll wait till um, all nominations are in and accepted before, uh, for chair before I ask for a vote and then I'll gladly give the gavel to whoever is the victor, um, so to speak. Any questions from a process perspective on the selection of a chair of the Amherst School Committee? Okay, do I have any nominations for chair? Mr. Demling. I nominate Allison McDonald. Is that agreeable to you? Agreeable is the word I'm starting to use these days, so. Um, <laughs> Are there other nominations for chair? So I'm just practicing my wait time, but seeing none, is there any discussion on that? Then I'll move the committee to a vote. All those in favor of Ms. McDonald becoming the chair of the Amherst School Committee, could you raise your hand and say aye? Okay, I count four. Any opposed? Any abstentions? One abstention. Congratulations. I did ask the committee to leave that chair seat uh, vacant because a chair seat in this room as compared to other rooms has um, a different microphone button. So you're welcome to stay or move, whatever you like. It's actually on, by the way. The microphone is, it's still lit. I was testing and clearly I'm a poor chair because I forgot to turn it off. So <laughs> thankfully my job here is done. I'll pass it over to Ms. McDonald. So it's on. So um, having never done this before, I'm taking a page out of um, Mr. Nakajima's book, which is um, looking to this committee for support. And um, um, I'll promise I'll be asking questions as we go along <laughs> so, and, and won't always get it right. Um, but our next order of business is to nominate and elect a vice chair for this committee. Do we have nominations? Ms. Spitzer, did you have a name? Oh, um, I'll nominate uh, Peter Demling. Do you, are you agreeable to this? Uh, yes. Any discussion? All those in favor? Oh, yeah, yes? Maybe we should just ask for our additional Additional nominations? So uh, all those in favor of uh, Peter Demling as vice chair, signify uh, yes by voting, raising your hand. No? Abstain? So it's 4-0-1. Um, and now we need um, nominations for secretary of the committee. And just as a reminder, the secretary um, is, is not responsible for taking minutes, um, but is a member of the Union 26 committee. Uh, any nominations for secretary? Mr. Nakajima? I nominate Carrie Spitzer to be secretary. Is this agreeable? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> any other nominations? Okay. All those in favor of uh, Carrie Spitzer as secretary of the committee, please signify aye by raising your hand. Four. No. 
Abstain? Four zero one. Okay. So our um, first order of business tonight is to review and approve minutes. However, um, given um, a lot of discussion on sort of the status of these minutes, we're going to table that and not look at, not review minutes tonight, but save it for um, our next meeting. Do we have any, um, so moving on to point number three, committee announcements and public comment. Do we have any committee announcements? Seeing none, um, move to um, public comment. Are there any, yes? And just as a reminder, um, to state your name, and you have three minutes for your comments. Thank you, my name is Tony Cunningham. Uh, thank you for commissioning the exploration of early childhood education in Amherst. I'm looking forward to hearing Ms. Hayes' presentation as I found her report very informative. Some information contained in the report confirmed what I already knew. For example, that the current partial day hours of the preschool do not meet the needs of working families and that the preschool is under-enrolled. I didn't know that the need is greater for infant and toddler care than for additional preschool slots and that in order for our district to partner with Community Action Pioneer Valley in providing care for babies, toddlers, or preschoolers from mixed socioeconomic backgrounds, it would require the district to significantly increase the hours of care. Both proposals outlined by Ms. Hayes would also necessitate the district providing increased classroom space, teachers, and transportation. I look forward to learning more about how that could be funded. The fact that the birth rate has been going up was a surprising data point and will be relevant to the enrollment projections for the new school building project. I was also interested in the concerns articulated by district staff about the current preschool location, including that there is inadequate space for children to engage in therapy or have a quiet calming space and a limited or non-accessible parking for families. This presumably will open up a conversation about locating infant, toddler, or preschool care at some other location and will need to be considered in the Crocker Farm expansion study that will hopefully begin soon. I hope you will take Ms. Hayes up on her suggestion to do a facilities assessment to determine the feasibility of locating early childhood classrooms on district grounds and to assess the current preschool program outcomes and potential impacts of reducing the number of slots in favor of expanding the hours of care. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other public comments? No? And as a reminder, we, um, the public is always welcome to email, um, email the committee at uh, schoolcommittee at arps.org. Um, and we're always listening and reading. Moving on to new and continuing business. Um, our first uh, order of business is the budget guidance review early childhood report. And this is a discussion. Oh, sorry, superintendent's update. Thank you. I need, I need support. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so the next point is superintendent's update. Dr. Morris? Sure. It's in your packet um, right after the minutes. Um, and I'll, I'm not going to read all of these just in the interest of time, but if there's questions, I can answer any. Uh, you'll hear from the Family Center in a couple minutes, but uh, one thing that they do of many is organize Juntos We Play, which is a, um, a structure by which we engage with the community um, at their site. And so this Saturday, January 25th, we'll be at Butternut Farms Community Room, and they do it at different housing areas uh, across the town. So thank you all for the Family Center for the work that you do. And, and seeing our staff in, in the neighborhood and the communities feels really different than when we have meetings uh, in our offices. Um, I think I will, um, I'll just go through them quickly. So uh, Crocker Farm held a the longstanding tradition of having a Martin Luther King Day celebration and they held it uh, last week and it starts with a whole school and whole community breakfast as well as assemblies and service projects. And one of the neat things is it really brings back many former staff members, former students, and former community members uh, connected to that school. Wildwood's um, seventh annual African American read-in uh, is likely confirming as we speak. Actually, um, Tuesday, February 4th, uh, the text gives a little bit of history, but it's been a great um, celebration in the past, and I know it will be this year. 
Um, something we haven't <coughs> talked about here, but there was a press release and news um, stories about it was um, that we worked with Eversource to have $55,000 essentially of uh, a lighting project complete, which is going to increase the energy efficiency um, of Crocker Farm and the lights, and that will pay off uh, for, us, for us in terms of the sustainability of the building, but also financially as well. Um, also, a number five bilingual education grant, which has already been shared with, with you in the community, that we were uh, the fortunate recipients of a competitive grant around that's specifically earmarked for what's called alternative English language education programs, um, but you know what we think of as ELL programs, and uh, while not explicitly only focused on ELL students, dual language programs are considered in that category. So we're very fortunate to have the support and very fortunate to be partnering again with Holyoke, which is, they've been wonderful partners. We have a conference call on Thursday, I think, of this week uh, as they're opening their second or have opened their second dual language school. They had one that was started before ours and um, we're sandwiched in the middle from a timeline perspective, but learning from each other's curriculum and program development has been really helpful. So we appreciate our colleagues a little bit south of here. Uh, uh, also for Fort River, there was a community meeting on the, uh, the very end of the last day of school before the December break, and it's just a wonderful experience. They've re renamed their what's formerly called assemblies community meetings, and they're trying to structure it quite differently. So it's not just a semantic change, but that even with a large group of students and, and, and staff members, the community is invited. You see many, many parents, um, guardians, and caretakers who attended the event, and there's a lot of bilingual um, music, but also in speech, and so it's not just the Comandantes program, it's really you know, pervasive across the school, which is really uh, great to see. We're having our elementary registration event on March 18th, and we're advertising that widely. We're hosting it in the Fort River School Library, but it's for all the schools, and we'll then have breakout sessions, kind of learning from last year's experience, which was positive, but some of the feedback we received, we'll have the whole group uh, registration event, which is really a celebration of all the things that uh, are wonderful going on in, in Amherst in our elementary schools, and then have breakout sessions for families who are interested in Comandantes, as well as if, if the school committee decides to be, stay a school choice district, families who are interested in school choice. Um, so we, when you try to do everything all in the same setting, you know, one of the feedback, uh, one piece of feedback we received last year had us rethink a little bit of the structure of that, so we'll do that. The Great Span Advisory Group concluded uh, its meetings on January 13th. Um, all the subgroups are intending to get me their reports uh, by February 1st, which means by early March we'll have the full compiled report with an executive summary uh, slide. So when we get to the end and we're thinking about future meetings, that's roughly the timeline for that. Uh, report cards, most families will receive revised standards-based report cards this year. There's a couple grade levels. Uh, teachers, staff are given a choice of jumping into them or uh, staying with the former report cards for one more year. And most, vast majority of teachers um, across grade levels at all schools have jumped into work on the new ones. It's a nine-month process. The thanks to Mr. Sheehan for facilitating that, that it's really uh, aligning what we grade with what we teach seems like a logical thing that we should be doing, and, and the standards guide what we teach, so the standards are also going to guide uh, what reports families receive. Uh, we'll be gathering data, so this is sort of a beta version of this, and we'll gather feedback uh, as we kind of finalize them, and by next year, everybody, all staff uh, and all families will be on the new report card template. And the last one, the Crocker Farm study, so the contract is with the vendor, and we're waiting to hear back, because um, I know we've talked about that at prior meetings, and once that receives, that, that study can go on, but right now it's sort of with the vendor, and we're just on hold till they return it to us. And that's the update. Mr. Nakajima. Uh, yeah, Dr. Morris, I was wondering, um, I, I can't remember seeing a presentation about the revision on report cards, and so if we had one, I just missed it, um, which could have happened, obviously. Um, but uh, I was wondering if you could maybe share with the committee, either in a future update or even just by email, uh, a copy of uh, the previous one, the standard one, and then of the beta one that, you're, that we're moving towards just for our own curiosity. Absolutely, sorry. I haven't been in a room in a while, so I'm getting back to the, the pressing the button. Um, absolutely, and this is something we intended this spring to bring a, 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 an update for the committee and the community with, with both uh, more, we can, do, the answer is yes, and uh, we'd like to, to show the community um, and as well as share the feedback we receive from um, all stakeholders. To forg forgive me, I mean, if, it, if it's forthcoming, that's totally cool. I, it, the way you were describing it, it sounded like the end of a project, and so I was sitting here thinking to myself, 
darn, I've been on the committee for three years. I don't remember a presentation on a subject, but it's my bad. But um, otherwise, I look forward to it. Mr. Demley. Um, so one, one topic I don't see here, and I'm just reminded that I haven't seen it in a while, is uh, breakfast, breakfast after the bell. Um, it occurred to me, uh, having seen the news recently, uh, that the state is about to pass a requirement for breakfast after the bell for districts that have 60 percent ED or above. You know, we're not near that, we're, but we still have a substantial percentage, you know, about a third of our kids. And we had some discussions, on, I'm just forgetting where it fell off in terms of the the radar, and I wanted, seeing that we don't have an agenda planning item later on, I just wanted to catch up on that and, and what, what the next steps are in your mind. I know that there were challenges in terms of um, facilities, maintenance, and, and whatnot when we were dealing with some issues at the start of the school year last year, but. Yep, so that's on our agenda for March, and, and since we were um, chairless, um, so we, you know, I figure I'll get together with the chair after this meeting, the new chair, uh, and map out the rest of the year. But it is tentatively on my list slated to be uh, reported on in March, the March 17th meeting. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? No? No, oh, Mr. Demley? I'm sorry, I just forgot. Um, so the, the, the grants that we got uh, um, and the co-grants with Holyoke Public Schools are, are great. Um, would, do you see this kind of investment as like an extra bonus or is this a uh, something we would have had to invest in anyway at, at the startup period or is this, or option C, <laughs> is this a, a level of expense that we might expect going forward where if we don't have it as a grant we might need to, to invest in it? Right, so uh, I think a significant portion of the grant it will go to supporting teachers to get the bilingual endorsement which wasn't a thing uh, until uh, it wasn't developed at the time we approached and, and the school committee, the Amherst School Committee approved us moving forward. So it's really a support of staff to get that and we're trying to get as many cohorts of staff through on the front end so that to your point we, can't re we don't rely on these grant funds. Uh, much like any other licensure issue, it's, um, it is technically the staff member's responsibility and yet we, what we know is staffing dual language programs is the number one challenge uh, you know, nationally about implementing them. So uh, working with Holyoke as well as higher education partners has been a primary focus. There are other pieces that have been really helpful with the startup, uh, but that is the bulk of the focus and I think it's really helpful as we're trying, we have wonderful staff in and trying to help them to get an endorsement that just came out last year. You know, uh, last year when we were starting, I think there were two vendors in the state, two universities um, that even were able, had the approval to offer the endorsement. So it's a very quickly evolving field and as more people go, there's more competition in the marketplace and that'll be a good thing for our staff members. Any other comments, questions? Yeah. Okay. Um, so now moving on to the next agenda item. <laughs> Um, we are moving to the budget guidance review early childhood report and this is a discussion so we're so I'm going to try to phone Kristen in and then I'll put it on speaker because I don't never use this phone before Let's see how this works I don't have to do nine one Hey, Kristen, it's Mike, how you doing? So we are ready for you, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put you on speaker, hopefully this works, and I will sit where the presenter usually sits, so I'll push your slides forward, so I'll just wait for you for direction on that. Okay. You still with us, Kristen? I can hear you. Okay. All right, five minutes, oh, okay. uh, Yes, please. So um, this topic came up out of a joint project uh, working with the town of Amherst. Uh, so we co-funded this exploration study to happen because we know early childhood education is, is a critically important thing, not just for the education of students, but for uh, the, the whole town as it is. Um, and so we worked with Kristen. She was planning to be here. If you remember, we were snowed out in December, so that's why we're doing this part of the meeting in, in January because the makeup date didn't work for her schedule. Um, 
and then there was a meeting that ran long. There's been a number of, of, of barriers for us. Um, but what, what Ms. Hayes did is she came in and, and both, as she did details in her report, she looked and met with our preschool staff, met with Head Start, uh, which is in a building right next to Wildwood Community Action. She looked at a tremendous amount of data about the town and the community and the evolving community that Amherst is and came up with a couple of options for the school committee and the district to consider. And so um, she is you know, obviously calling in remotely, but I'll work on the slides. And so I'll just ask the committee if you have a question at some point you know, to voice that. Um, but I think uh, you know, if, we, if we can wait a little bit, it's not that many slides, uh, wait till the end. And I think it's also important to note this was not, and, and I think this is underlined uh, in page three of the report, I believe, or, or early in the report, this was not an evaluation of our preschool program. It's not an evaluation of the Crocker Farm preschool program. Uh, it was clear what, it was trying to be clear what it was and it wasn't. It valued the comments that uh, Ms. Hayes heard from our preschool, uh, and, but was not, Ms. Hayes was never here while students were in the preschool setting. It was on a Friday when students don't attend. Uh, so it's just an important note that if we're doing a program evaluation, we're very clear and transparent about it. And when we're not, we, will, we want to be equally clear and transparent. And this was really looking about zero to five and what are the needs in the community and what might be some ways to fill them, particularly as our community evolves. So with that, I'll turn it over to Kristen remotely um, to walk us through uh, the summary of her report on the slides. Okay, great. Thanks, Mike. Can you just confirm for me that folks can hear me? Yes. Great. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm sorry we're not getting to meet in person. I'm about two hours away from you, so thank you for having me via remote connection. Mike has a very brief PowerPoint presentation that he is going to advance for me. Um, purpose of the PowerPoint is just to give you in broad strokes how it was that I approached to this project. And once I'm done with the PowerPoint, I'm happy to respond to questions or, um, you know, offer any additional guidance that you may want at this time. Does that work for everyone? Right. Yep. Okay, great. So let's talk just briefly about the report that I submitted to Mike. Um, Mike is in possession of a 20-page report from me, which I've diluted into essentially five PowerPoint slides. So my purpose in engaging with the district and the town was really to consider what the opportunities might be for expansion of early education services in the community. And so what you should be seeing on the slide right now are the report components. And it includes basic community demographics, which were obtained via the U.S. Census Bureau, as well as some local resources, um, as well as some phone calls to folks in your community to gather data. The report also contains an overview of eligibility for the National Head Start and Early Head Start programs. The National Head Start program serves children from three years until kindergarten entry and the National Early Head Start Program serves children from birth until their third birthday. The report also includes an overview of three different funding opportunities and possible models that I think would be worth exploring. Um, some of the models I think are more feasible than others, but I did want to lay out for the district and the town some options going forward. And then finally, some ideas about next steps for the district, specifically around some actions that I think the district should take to evaluate items that were not included in my report. So what you will notice is not included in the report, as Mike alluded to, I did not engage in an assessment of the programming's current quality. As Mike said, I was there on a Friday. I did not see children in session and I was there to more or less assess the feasibility of creating more preschool opportunities for vulnerable kids. I was not there to assess whether or not the children who are in your programming right now are making the advances and are kindergarten ready per the expectations of the district and per the expectations of their IEPs. So I was not there to do that. I also found as the project went on that I was unable to make an assessment of facility space. And the reason I'm making that statement is that in general, I found there was a lot of discussion about facilities in the community. 
I know there are um, decisions to be made about how existing facility space is used. And so given there's not a clear roadmap that was presented to me in the fall of 2019, I determined that I could not really consider facilities as part of this project at this time. And then finally, the report also does not include an assessment of what I would consider organizational structure and supports for the staff around the current programming. Um, the line of questioning that I pursued with staff was to understand strengths and challenges of families and to pair that information, that qualitative information, with what I could ascertain quantitatively um, as far as things like census data and other headcount data in the community was to pair the two. So it was not to assess whether or not the current org structure and supports are working well for staff. Mike, if I could ask you to advance the slide. All set. Great, thank you. So the slide you're looking at right now, I just want to share with you some key demographics that I considered when thinking about what might be feasible for the district moving forward. And what I relied on was the American Community Survey five-year estimates. That is a data set that is widely used to determine eligibility for both state and federal funding in early education. And so I paired my work with how it is we would have to apply for such funds and essentially found that there are approximately 826 children under the age of five in Amherst, and perhaps most importantly for my work, about 23% of them uh, are expected to be living in poverty. And just to put that in perspective, what that means per the current 2020 federal poverty guidelines is that essentially a family of four is earning just over $26,000 a year if they are to be considered in poverty. So nearly one quarter of your population meets that benchmark for a child. Further, the majority of children in your community are living in homes with all parents working. Um, and by all parents, that means a two-parent household where both parents are working, as well as a single-parent household where, where that single parent is working. But again, it's, it's more than half of the children in your community have parents working outside the home. There are over 300 licensed child care slots, and that's a relevant data point for us in considering the need for early education. Many of those child care slots do accept subsidy payment, which is a payment that a lower income family can secure from the state to assist with the cost of child care. But what that tells you is there's quite a gap. We have about 826 children under the age of five, and we have 313 licensed child care slots. Those licensed child care slots include some school age children. So what I'm saying to you is that the relative amount of care that's available likely does not meet the need of the community. And that's especially true of the zero to three population where there are very few dedicated slots for infants and toddlers in your community. Other key demographics that I considered were the rate of English language learners in your district, which absolutely outpaces the state as well as children, students with disabilities, which again definitely outpaces the state. The final thing you'll see on this slide is that what I heard loud and clear from staff, and I'm using that term very broadly to include any administrators as well as teaching staff that I had a chance to talk with, was that there are challenges with the current programming's hours of service because it's a part day program and that there is a strong need, a strong reported need, for more support to address trauma and better connecting what's happening at home with the supports that are provided at school. And I'll share with you, I mean, that trend is nationwide, um, this issue of responding to early childhood trauma. I think that as our knowledge of the impacts of trauma grows, we're seeing more and more of our workforce reporting, feeling as though they need additional supports to address those early adverse experiences that children are facing right now. So these are just some of the demographics that I considered. There are more outlined in the report, but I think these are sort of the high-level important ones to say to you tonight. Mike, if you could advance the slide. Yep, all set. Well 
Thank you. Um, the next slide you're looking at, I wanted to give you a sense of how Head Start and Early Head Start would look at the Amherst community. Um, the reason I wanted to consider Head Start and Early Head Start is, is really twofold. One is that you do have relatively high numbers of children living in poverty at almost a quarter of your, your child population. And there is a existing Head Start and Early Head Start program in your community operated by Community Action Pioneer Valley. Um, in, in full disclosure, I do consult with them. Um, I know quite a bit about their community and have visited their sites. And so I'm very knowledgeable with their actual services, and I've seen their services in action. But what you're seeing here is our best guess of the estimated number of children in poverty by age and then correlating it to what the enrollment is in the Head Start and Early Head Start program. So for sake of argument, I estimate there are approximately 127 children from birth to three living in poverty in your community, and you only have 16 early Head Start slots, which tells me that you're serving about 12% of the eligible population in Amherst. Um, and then the estimated number of children who are preschool age, those three- to five-year-olds, your service rate is considerably higher on the Head Start side at 44%. Some of those children are also duly enrolled in your district programming where they receive services um, at Crocker Farm for part of the day, and then they are transported over to the Head Start program for the remainder of the day. So some of those 77 children who I estimate are living in poverty likely are getting services both through the district preschool program as well as the Head Start program, and so there's some degree of double counting there. The purpose in sharing this slide is really to say two things to you. One is that given the few number of slots in the community for low-income zero- to three-year-olds, both through the Early Head Start program as well as through those subsidized child care slots, there's a real acute need to service children younger in that zero to three population. Um, on the preschool side of the house, the Head Start service rate at 44% is essentially at the low end of the national averages. So if I were to travel across the country, I would see anywhere from about 40 to 60% of Head Start eligible kids being served in individual communities. So at 44%, the Amherst community is on the lower side of that range. And the reason that's so important is because the Head Start and Early Head Start program, they're one of those two-generation models where you're supporting families and simultaneously supporting children. Um, and this whole family approach has really been shown through research to lead to really positive outcomes as far as school readiness for kids, but also as far as a number of physical and mental health uh, outcomes for families. So I think the Head Start and Early Head Start program is an important player in your community, particularly when we consider what we're hearing from teaching staff that they need more support responding to trauma. I'm going to make the argument that large percentages of these Early Head Start and Head Start eligible children have experienced trauma in the home. Um, and these are the kids that are ultimately transitioning to your district for kindergarten and beyond. Mike, if I could ask you to advance the slide. All set. So the model that strikes me as likely to be most successful in your community is essentially for the district and town to partner with the local Head Start program, which again is operated through Community Action Pioneer Valley. And the reason I think this is compelling is that there's a real opportunity gap in the community. You know, essentially, I have 800 children living at or below federal poverty um, in your community from birth to five. And you have an incredible income range in your community, as I'm sure you're aware. And while I have that count of over 800 children, I also have relatively high median income. Um, I have relatively high home prices, et cetera. And so your community on paper definitely comes across as one where there's a real opportunity gap in that an absolute definable subset of your population is probably not accessing high-quality care in those first five years. There's relatively few Head Start and Early Head Start slots. There's relatively few district preschool slots. 
And when you put those two together, it, what it tells me is that it, there's very uneven entry into kindergarten. And I think that's why I was engaged in the first place, was to try to put some thought around what actions could the district and town take to sort of better, you know, level the playing field for kindergarten entry. The, the challenge with thinking about Head Start and Early Head Start is not so much on the funding side as it is on the programming side. Um, the current Head Start model requires 1,020 hours of early education services to be provided to a Head Start child, so 1020 hours. And right now, Amherst Part Day programming is going to clock in at anywhere from four to 500 hours for a child, depending on how many days they attend and, and depending on whether it's a you know, three-hour day or a longer day. Um, and the real challenge would be, in order to execute that partnership, it would absolutely require the district to look at the current park day programming in that that park day programming is not going to be viable with Head Start. The other, the other issue, though, is that I think the district and town bring a lot of assets and resources to the table that would be very attractive to a Head Start program, such as Community Action Pioneer Valley in that you, you do have facilities and transportation and you do have highly qualified teachers. Um, so, you know, I think that there's a lot to be said for the assets and resources that the district would bring as well as the assets and resources that a Head Start program would bring. I think it's worth out, pointing out that the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, which funds the National Head Start program, has, since 2014, put out hundreds of millions of dollars in competitive grant funds to expand services to the zero to three population. They have not put out any new money for the three to five population. And so if you were to pursue a further collaboration with Community Action Pioneer Valley, I think it would likely involve going for competitive money to service zero to three-year-olds and then asking them to strategically work with you to allocate some of their existing preschool resources over to your three- to five-year-old population. And, Mike, that final slide, if you could, just briefly lays out what I see as some of the strengths and assets that the district would bring to this work as well as the Head Start program would bring to this work. Um, I do think the report tries to highlight each of these items. Um, as well as provide you with a lot of context by which to think about the Head Start program. So I would definitely encourage, if you haven't had a chance already, to take a look at the report to sort of, you know, grow your understanding of Head Start if that's not a program that you're familiar with, and then to consider the strengths and assets that the district might bring to that equation to better service more vulnerable three- to five-year-olds. And, Mike, that's it for slides. Let's, let's digest um, what, looking around for questions. We could go down the, down the row like we like to do. Do you want to add anything? I think the, the committee can ask questions. I might have some thoughts at the end, but um, I think we use this time well for the committee to ask questions or offer comments um, based on the report. Mr. Demling? Um, so, yeah, thank you very much uh, for this report. Uh, it's something our community and our schools have, have wanted to look at for a long time. Um, th there's a lot of questions I have, so I, I don't want to dominate the conversation. I'll just ask sort of the two biggest ones that jump out at, at me. One is, um, you know, unless I'm mistaken, and Dr. Morris, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it's, it's never been in the primary mission, at least up, up until now, for our public schools to service students less than two years and nine months. The, the reason why we have a preschool program at all is because there's a state mandate to service children with identified disability who are on, a, on an IEP, and so that those are the, mm -hmm. the, the, the students. And so, um, uh, you know, so that's the first, like, big sort of philosophical um, mission question I, I sort of grapple with is, um, you know, obviously there's a need um, for, for the population um, and, and, and yet, is it, is it something, like, I, I guess my, my question for that would be, is, is this something you've, you've seen done and done successfully at scale uh, in other public school districts, either in Massachusetts or in, in other, other states? Sure. 
So I can answer the question. I mean, I, I agree with your assessment of historically where have the public schools sat on this issue. When I first started working at the U.S. Department of Ed in 2002, I mean, frankly, public schools wanted nothing to do with early education earlier than age three, period. What I would say to you is as the brain development research has become so clear and so robust, much of which is coming out of Harvard University, um, as to the need to intervene with children before age three, particularly low-income children, children who are experiencing homelessness, are engaged in the child welfare system, and kids with disabilities. When you take those four groups of vulnerable kids, there's very strong evidence that intervening before three is necessary. And as that evidence has started to become more part of sort of the mainstream conversation, if you were to attend strategic planning sessions with large districts, you would hear them talking about sort of a birth to 22 view of the world. And it is not uncommon to find school districts competing for zero to three services. Um, I, I work with a large school district in Texas. They serve 14,000 kids a year at College Station, um, where Texas A&M is located. And the district directly serves 120 zero to three-year-olds each year um, and then serves about 300 preschoolers using a blended funding approach of both federal Head Start money as well as state money. And the reason they serve those 120 zero to threes is because they found that those children who got services before age three, when coupled with services from three to five, made far greater gains in certain areas of kindergarten readiness that they were looking for, specifically mathematics skills, social emotional development, and early literacy. So I think there are many examples that we could point out where school districts have moved in this direction, but you're absolutely right. I mean, to me, it's a major philosophical shift. It requires a really hard look and conversation about resource allocation, and it, it takes time. It's not a quick, it's not a quick movement. Uh, thank, thank you for that answer. That, that, that is helpful. Um, I think that lays a, a groundwork for some good future discussions uh, with the school and the town. Um, so, so what you what you just mentioned at the end there um, that it, it requires talking about uh, resource allocation. So you, you had a phrase there uh, would require the town and schools to bring assets to the table. So, so this is the other sort of brass tacks pragmatic um, uh, reaction I have to all this is that. Um, you know, I mean, not to bore you with, with the details, but um, I mean, our schools are, are running on a tight budget as it is, um, even, in, even in this good economy. And um, it's, it's not to say that we, we have uh, the budgets of, of some other cities and towns in the state that are really hurting because we don't. We're very fortunate to have the support that we do. Um, and yet we, we don't have reams and reams of resources that we're just looking for a purpose for. Um, and our town uh, is also uh, resource uh, constrained. Um, has its own challenges, and, and the state uh, has yet, um, at least for our district and the challenges that we face financially, has yet to indicate that there's going to be some new order of magnitude of funding coming, coming down the pike. You know, therefore, uh, it's, it's great to think about um, you know, grants that could help us, but for, for something that we, where we would be really moving in a major way to shift the mission of our, uh, of our services to, to younger children, um, I think I would find it challenging to to invest in that, not knowing that that grants would definitely be there for a long time to cover that, given that we don't have a lot of resources. So um, I, I don't know if you have any thoughts, just in terms of the, that practical implementation resource finding. Sure. So with something like Early Head Start for the zero to three population, um, so say the existing Head Start provider in the community, again, Community Action Pioneer Valley, decided that they wanted to work with you to have, you know, 16 or 32 slots for that zero to three population, they would be applying for funds from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services to operate those slots, um, and they would go in at a cost per child basis of somewhere between fourteen and $17,000 per student, and that money would be annual, and it would be a five-year grant eligible for renewal at the end of five years. So what I'm saying to you is that Head Start programming is pretty stable as far as the money is concerned. Um, as, as you probably know, it's a program that dates back to the 1960s, and there are agencies that have received funding every single year since 1965 for Head Start. 
but the grants are five-year grants, and they're performance-based, and so provided there's no deficiencies, the grants are fully renewable for another five years. Uh, it's a very stable funding source. It's also received increases from Congress in both Republican and Democratic Congresses. Thank you. Sorry, I'm a little... It's, it's weird not having a face to address, so apologies. But thank you very much for, for this report. Um, I have a couple comments. Some are very small, and then I, some are really big picture. Um, one is that I think, and I apologize, I, I would have liked to have gotten you some of these figures earlier, but I'm just aware, I know you, um, you were limited to places that were centers, and so we're missing all the, the family-based um, programs here, but I think we're also missing a few um, centers that are available in Amherst, like the Hampshire Earn Early Learning Center. So um, I'm wondering if maybe I could send an email with some of the other places that could be added to the tables in the future. The other really kind of um, detail-oriented, and then I'll get up to the big picture, is just that when we're using the American Community Survey data, I think it's really important to share with the public that it's it's got a really big margin of error. So I just went on yeah. a fact finder, and that figure we keep going back to of 192 ages birth to um, five years living in poverty, that, that's their estimate, but it has a margin of error plus or minus 130 people. So that could mean that mm -hmm. we're really over or underestimating, and I think when we're talking about this, it's important to keep that in mind, because the need could be a lot greater, actually. Um, or it could be a lot smaller. And I, I think it's just really important with the five-year estimate data to, to emphasize that it's also um, over such a long time period. It's over five years. It's the average, and it's, 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 a, it's a big estimate. So this is a plug for everybody to complete the census that's coming up in 2020, because hopefully we'll get some better numbers then. Um, mm -hmm. And I know you're working with the best data you have. I just think when we're presenting it, um, it's important to, to, to keep that in mind. So I guess, kind of following on what Mr. Dumbling was saying, I'm curious about, you know, who else should be at the table when we're having this conversation? Because I think he's right that it's 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 a lot to put on, on on the school committee. And I think everybody, you know, I'm a I'm a mom. I've got three kids, seven and under, and so I have tried to find um, infant slots. I've tried to find preschool slots. And you are absolutely right. There is not enough. Um, opportunity for anybody of any income in this town in terms of finding those infant slots and in terms of finding slots that meet the schedule of a working parent. Right now, the schedules are, are just, I, I'm always piecing things together, and I'm sure that people with fewer resources are having a much harder time of it than I am. So I, I, I think the need is really, really um, acute in this town for, for, for quality child care um, and for all of the reasons that it improves people's ability to, um, you know, exceed in when they get to school, but also for the, the parents who are economically struggling, I don't know how you can find work when you don't have childcare um, that'll let you work at least a, an eight-hour day. And that's a really big problem. So I think we, you know, it's not just about the kids, it's about the whole family. Um, so I'm wondering, in your experience, like, who, who else should be in the room when we're talking about this? Um, because it sounds like you're saying that there is funding for the Head Start, um, and I think we're feeling a little bit like it's a really big burden to put this all on, on the school committee, even, even th through this partnership. So I'm just curious about how other communities have gone about it and trying to address this type of need. Sure. So, I mean, what I would say is from my perspective and the experience I've seen, um, in general, you know, school committee, the ask of school committee is really that school committee create the vision and, and buy into where it is we're going. Um, the, the work of, you know, sort of convening stakeholders, you know, in general, there's, there's a number of stakeholder groups that we would want to convene to explore this. So first and foremost, you guys can't move forward with securing this money without Community Action Pioneer Valley, right? So, I mean, clearly they need to be at the table. Um, I reached out to the two early intervention providers for children zero to three with special needs in your community. Um, I suspect they have quite a bit to say about what kinds of services they perceive families and children to need and the type of work that they're doing to ready kids to transition to your preschool right now. So early intervention to me is a provider who needs to be fully engaged. Um, 
every community has, you know, what I would consider to be sort of the stellar early education programmings that are highly desired in the community. Um, larger communities have entire child care planning commissions that are pulled together. You guys will not have that, but in general, there's a high value placed on hearing from sort of those private pay child care providers about what they're experiencing in their classrooms. Um, you need parent feedback. You know, one of the limitations of this report is that because I'm looking at really like systems and not services, I don't have any parent feedback to go off of. And in the end, parents create the demand for the service, right? So... You know, oftentimes there are, there are mothers groups or other parent groups in the community who are sought after for their insight into need. Um, I think public health is an important partner in this. You know, if we're going to talk about serving kids younger, um, knowing what some of those early health indicators are around immunizations and well-child exams and screening and assessment and referral is incredibly important. Public health can be a conduit to physicians in the community, dentists in the community, mental health providers in the community who are doing this work with young families. So I, I think in general it's, you know, it's a real collaboration between sort of public and private stakeholders, those who are likely to benefit directly from the services, as well as those who, frankly, are not likely to benefit but who've experienced, as you, as you suggested, the, you know, going through looking for care, going through shopping around for preschool, those families have a lot of value here in this conversation. So I agree with what, what Kristen said. I think the thing I'd add, and saw a presentation on this a couple of years ago, Cincinnati, uh, which is a very different community uh, in a whole host of ways. Um, in 2016, uh, had a bond issue. Um, and I'm not suggesting that, we, that Amherst goes this way, but I think that there's a relevant um, end to this story. And it was around early childhood access. So, I mean, you can look it up. Um, it's pretty easy to find. And one of the things that was notable when I saw the presentation was the number of um, civic organizations that were also involved. So in addition to everything that, that, that Kristen said, uh, the United Way was a huge supporter of this effort. And was so, um, you know, what that looks like in Amherst, I think, would take some dialogue. Uh, but what I noticed and what I saw, because I saw this presentation on the, um, about two weeks before the vote, uh, which was successful in Cincinnati, it was on the presidential election ballot um, in, Ohio, in Cincinnati, Ohio, was really that it was a community dialogue and community conversation, because if we're talking about the demographics of students that are on these slides that we, um, Kristen and, and the committee and myself have expressed a real interest in supporting, uh, where are the voices, you know, how can, how can we all show leadership, and by we, I don't mean just a collective we on this uh, um, here tonight, but how does the community show leadership that this is a community value? Uh, and I think Cincinnati and other communities have gotten that right, and I think there's some symbolic, you know, in terms of what's the role of the school committee or what role do I feel about highlighting this as a, being a primary issue in the community and seeing who's willing to partner with us. There's certainly no shortage of uh, interested folks in issues of social justice and poverty in the community, and whether this is an issue that, you know, strikes fire and the community jumps on board of or not, I think will determine a lot of uh, how successful we can make it, because I think the more partners we have in the work, the better off we are. Mr. Nakatimi. Thank you. Uh, I guess first I just want to thank uh, Ms. Hayes for the report and uh, Dr. Morris for putting this work forward and really launching it. Uh, I remember when I first got on the school committee a few years ago, we talked about preschool, we talked about the need in the community, and the conversation turned in ways that felt a little hopeless and also a little uh, non-actionable, meaning we couldn't figure out what the resources were, the information, the first steps. And even when we had, if you, when somebody goes back and looks at the, the tapes of it, they'll see we couldn't even really figure out how to launch the conversation in a way that didn't feel like we were immediately suggesting that we were going to have to raid other accounts or line items if we wanted to try to move this forward and then the constant worry about if we did it, where would we even put it and that kind of thing. And so the one thing I really appreciate about the work, A, is just the effort and stick to to use a phrase that, that the superintendent shown in this case. And then also the fact that there is information in the report that allows you to start thinking about where you could focus. Because um, again, it's that when I read this, it wasn't a report that said we figured out a pathway towards solving the entire problem for the whole community, which is, I think, what everyone would love to do. It's even just pointing out an acute need at whatever scale 
and saying, look, there are actually models or pathways to, to, to that could be worked on. So I think, A, I applaud you for that. Uh, and then the, the two questions that arise for me out of that are one, since you mentioned doing work, this is from says, since you mentioned doing work in College Station near Texas A&M, I guess one question I had there was, um, was the university, A, a partner in the process of um, investing in um, hosting or solving that programmatic need in the community? And were like similar to what people would perceive as probably true in Amherst, was it also a population um, in need, that there were, there were in fact grad students or undergraduates who had kids who could benefit from the programs uh, from an early uh, education zero, three or three to five expansion. Mm -hmm. So that's a question. Mm -hmm. And then the second, the second question I've been also asked both of them now is, um, you know, I don't know if you've talked about this with Dr. Morris, but what would be the next steps? Because I think other members of the committee have hinted at questions they need more definition around or things they'd want to know more about or even who you, like who you'd partner with to me the question sort of organically is you know have you thought about or has dr morris talked or talked about with you what would how, in order for the committee to do something useful with this it seems to me we have to have um even sort of a sketch pad of what things we would want to be doing next even to explore if we wanted to go further those are the two okay. questions thank you very much Sure. So let me take this, the College Station question. So College Station's uh, Head Start and Early Head Start program, as well as their state-funded programming, is all co-located um, in a central office, a central administrative office, much like yours, approximately half a mile from the Mont Texas A&M University, which has an undergrad population of 50,000. So... Yes, they partner very strongly. Um, Texas A&M provides, you know, teacher training, teachers in training to the program. Um, any number of interns and volunteers are recruited by the school district from Texas A&M. Obviously, you know, all of their teachers have a baccalaureate or master's degree from Texas A&M because it's right there. Um, they also have a lot of graduate students. Not like your community, a lot of international graduate students, um, and a lot of their students' income is quite low on paper, and so the reality is those students qualify for heavily subsidized care or, or fully subsidized. So their student population, as far as zero to five, can look a bit like what I suspect your community zero to five population could look like. And, you know, while I offer Texas A&M and College Station examples all over the country. Um, San Francisco used to have San Francisco State University providing early education and care through Head Start. Uh, UCLA, Southern California. So, I mean, there are definitely large institutions of higher ed in communities, and those higher ed partners are a major player, especially around staffing and workforce, and then secondly, around recruitment eligible families. So that, I hope, gives you some sort of idea on that. And then... As far as next steps, so I very briefly at the end of the report say I think there are two things that need to be done relatively soon. One is, you know, something along the lines of a facilities assessment to consider how feasible it would be to locate, you know, additional classrooms on district grounds. Um, because right now, for example, the Head Start, Early Head Start program is located near one of your elementary schools, but it's not actually on your district grounds. Um, and I think, you know, part of the, the wonder, if you will, of having more programming on district grounds is that these kids are part of that school community from a really young age. Um, and so when they transition, just like a Crocker Farm, when they transition from preschool to kinder, it's all under the same roof. And so, like, it's a very comfortable transition for kids and for their families. So, uh, and I know facilities is definitely a larger question. Um, again, I, I felt like I kind of had to shy away from it just given the number of things that seem like they're being discussed. But I think understanding how early education would fit into any future facility project is a pretty immediate need. The other thing I'm suggesting is I did not look at the program quality. The current program basically serves children with special needs with some additional slots for what we might term model children or typically developing children. 
And I think it's important to understand whether or not the current programming is meeting their pre-academic needs, their social emotional needs, et cetera. Um, and I'm sure some degree of that happens relative to children with IEPs where we're measuring, you know, their progress towards meeting their IEP goals. I'm less sure whether that's happening for model or typically developing children. Um, it strikes me that the way the programming is set up right now, it sounds as though it's really meant to service the special needs population. And so I'm not sure whether or not non-special needs children are obtaining the outcomes that are desired by their families, first and foremost, and that secondarily are desired by the district for kindergarten readiness. So understanding that is important for thinking about what future programming might look like because it would influence things like curricula choices. It would influence things like individualization uh, of services to children and their families. So I think, you know, in summary, both the facility side and sort of the existing outcome side are important questions that I think the district should seek to provide some answers to as you move this project forward. Mr. Harrington? Yeah, I just had a real quick question regarding um, DCF. I was wondering if you had any data on uh, an increase or yeah, I guess an increase of uh, contact with DCF with Head Start families and uh, whether or not you could define that as positive or negative contact? Sure. So I think it's an excellent question. And Mike has heard me lament the fact that the challenge that we're having is that the DCF data is not available disaggregated by community. So what happens is DCF reports out quarterly based on where their a DCF office is located. And so I can pull things like the number of children who are on the DCF caseload. I can pull things like whether it's abuse or neglect. I can pull information about what the reunification plan is. But I cannot pull that information just for your community. The, the data is not available at that sort of sub-level. All I can pull is, for example, the Greenfield office, which encompasses, you know, a dozen communities in the area. I think part of that is because, in general, Massachusetts data is not available when the count is 10 and under. They only report things at 11 and over. Um, I made multiple phone calls to DCF representatives, both at the, like, sort of local office as well as the state, to try to see if I could put in, essentially, a public information request just for the Amherst community. And no one has been able to answer that question. So that is part of why you don't see that information in the report. I agree it is valuable information. I track that information in Western Mass for Community Action Pioneer Valley, um, but I'm not able to get it at the community level that I think would be most impactful for your school committee and for the town. Um, any, any final thoughts? We're, we're well beyond time, so I'm, I'm not going to add very much. We've had a really rich discussion, lots of questions. I'm looking. Mr. Demling? Yeah. Uh, just really briefly. Um, so one, I, I don't think we should draw any conclusions about um, whether families on ch for kids not on IEPs in our current preschool program are driving benefit or not. I think as we saw at the top of the report, that's, this wasn't part of that scope. Um, but I did want to say briefly, and I don't know if uh, Dr. Morris can comment on, uh, there was so references to trauma and um, feedback from, uh, from teachers about uh, resources to, to help kids with trauma. And um, I know this is related to expanding preschool and early childhood access, but I, I, do, I do also see it as, as a separate issue. You know, there's, there's, it's one thing to say, let's have a trauma-informed classroom or curriculum. It's yet another thing to have professional level intervention to, to treat and, and to provide intervention for for you know traumatic experience of uh, with with young children, um, uh, which which is a, a, I think a separate conversation about how we how we meet needs. Um, so I just wanted to put a point on that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, I think that we're all set. Yeah, I think the only thing I'll add is I think on that the last point on. Um, on the report, you know, I do intend to work with Ms. Fetterman, who is, Julie has been the uh, conduit from the town to be working on this, um, and follow up with, with Kristen to see what our next steps and what additional data sources can we, um, and report um, 
not at, maybe at this scale, can we gather from the funding that we, you know, partnered on the and established last year? So um, I would expect this to come back, um, and we'll loop back with some more information uh, probably later this spring. Great, good. I mean, you're motioning like you need. Do you want to say no? So um, thank you. Um, uh, Kristen, for your uh, presentation, and I think that's we can say goodbye. I don't know how to hang up this phone. Do Thank, I you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Press the speaker button. I think you'll okay. be all right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Excellent. Okay. Um, so moving on, we're a little bit behind, um, but we're going to move on to our next um, topic, which is dual language enrollment, um, and this is a presentation on enrollment guide. I'll do, I'll do a very quick introduction as Ms. Richardson comes up, which is uh, last month in December. Uh, we shared some initial thoughts with, with the committee and got feedback from the committee. And we kind of scoped it out as that would be the initial exploration that we would have Ms. Richardson come back and present uh, adjustments to the formal document that was um, created last year and receive feedback from the committee to come with the final document to be voted in the February meeting. So it would be in advance of the registration period and we can be very clear with families and staff in the community, families in the community and staff about what our registration process uh, will look like this year. Um, so there were some minor adjustments made, particularly um, you'll notice, and I'm not trying to steal Ms. Richardson's thunder, but um, <laughs> that uh, the creation, if, if ends up being that there are school choice students admitted, there was a suggestion that there would be a group 2A. We like that, so uh, we put that in. Uh, and there were some other minor changes that we experienced uh, based on staff experience last year, but I would say the majority of the document um, sits unchanged, um, but really your feedback last meeting was uh, there was an attempt to integrate it. I'll leave Ms. Richardson if you'd like to add to that. Sure. Um, so thanks for having this conversation back. And I think, um, as Dr. Mara said, there's not a whole lot of change, but we did just try to mostly integrate the option for school choice students who were already accepted via school choice, who happened to be from Spanish-speaking homes, um, to be able to take unfilled seats uh, just within that group um, if we still had remaining seats uh, by August 15th. So we did want to really push that to the very end of the process to make sure that we're accommodating the students that are um, coming into the district. And so I think um, I'm happy to answer questions about any part of the document, but that's really the biggest piece was just updating the, um, you know, the dates for this year and then clarifying the role that that potential school choice group could have. Any questions? No? Mr. Demming? Uh, so thank you for this. Um, I like the change. Um, my one question is, is on the number of slots that would be um, made, kept available until August 15th. So, um, so reading from one of the paragraphs, if fewer than 20 students enroll in the Spanish-speaking bilingual group at this time, the remainder of 20 unfilled seats will be kept available for late enrollment of Spanish bilingual stu students through August 15th. So if, if the program from a bilingual effectiveness perspective still operates as effectively with 24, and, and our primary goal is, is to reach um, Spanish, um, not, uh, English language learners, Spanish speaking English language learners, then why wouldn't we have that be 24 instead of 20 and then just notify everybody else uh, of their status on, on August 15th? Mm -hmm. So I think that was somewhat of a compromise to, there are different ways of looking at it, right? There's one approach which is to say it's a really um, half and half, uh, Spanish speaking and English speaking, but because of the complexity of the community, we know it's more complicated, right? So those were kind of just the numbers we negotiated where last year when we thought about, well, if we had more than 20, we absolutely would want to make sure that they were given a seat. And yet it does feel like based on the makeup of our community that having 20 seats for English speakers you know, if we don't have the Spanish or bilingual students in the community to fill that space does feel appropriate. So it's kind of within that range that we feel like it's educationally sound is kind of where we're coming from. Does that sound fair? Yeah. And we've had active conversations on this very question. Um, and honestly, differences of opinion within our yeah. group. And this is sort of where we landed uh, as a proposal, but certainly open to committee feedback on that question as well. Mm -hmm. 
So I had a question. Um, mm -hmm. I, uh, thank you for bringing this back. And thank I, sure. what I really appreciated was the examples that you gave at the on the second mm -hmm. page because I found that really helpful to sort of um, map through the various sort of snaky ways that you could make your way through this um, yeah. lottery. But I did have one question, and maybe um, it, it, maybe I'm just reading it wrong. But that that same paragraph that Mr. Demling was cited, the next um, section, um, I found confusing. So I was wondering if you could explain it, which is if more than 24 students enroll in groups one and two, so the, the Spanish-speaking groups, those who are not offered a seat based on the lottery drawing on May 4th will mm -hmm. be entered into the pool for the next lottery group based on their enrollment zone. Mm -hmm. So that does that, do I read that to understand that a, a Spanish-speaking, so, so somebody who would be in group one or group two would then be in the lottery with the English speaking or non Spanish speaking uh, in enrollment groups. Is that? That is how it was, yeah, crafted okay. last year. So it's really, we put it there as a contingency. We think it's highly unlikely that that would ever happen. We're trying very much to avoid that. But who knows, you know, in a couple of years, it was sort of thinking longer range like, what if we do have a, you know, more. Um, Spanish speakers coming into our community for this program, and what if that ends up being that there are 30 of them, and that only leaves 10 seats, and how do we think about that? So mm -hmm. um, this was sort of a way to say, well, we really want to prioritize that group, but then there is a point at which we would say, well, there, you know, we'll draw a line, and then we would enter them into the other lottery. So, okay. got it. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Ms. Spitzer? Um, I apologize if we've already talked about this, but okay. I have a question about the, the It's siblings. all quite confusing, so. <laughs> no, it's okay. So, and, and I'm Go trying ahead. to remember back to the last meeting, and I don't have my notes with me, but the mm -hmm. question about siblings, did we have the sibling preference last year as well? We, well, we didn't have any siblings coming in, right, so. yet, but this was how the policy was written last year, and there was some conversation among this committee about different options where we could change that, but um, Dr. Morris and I didn't feel like there was any resolution or sort of actionable step to take on that conversation, so we left it for now. And that makes sense. And I'm, I'm starting to just think about um, as we're moving forward and the timeline that we're at now, it's potentially that like a kindergartner, I could see having um, a sibling a sibling who would, you know, yeah. five years from now, where we're in a new situation with potentially fewer schools. And I guess I, I'm just thinking, mm -hmm. I think we really want to be care. I think this is, is good for now, but thinking forward to, are we creating um, preferences that might be shifting as we move towards a new um, geographic reality. I don't want to get into too many details, but it right. seems like these will have consequences, um, policies will have consequences as we move forward towards a new potential building situation. Mm -hmm. So I'll take that one if it's mm -hmm. okay. So uh, we have loosely talked about that. I think we're a little ways away from knowing exactly what that looks like, but I think in the scenario as I'm intuiting that you're referencing, if there was two elementary schools in Amherst at some point in the future instead of three elementary schools at some point in the future, I could understand where the sibling piece could get a little awkward and yet our commitment um, for the time being would be to follow through on the commitment when students, um, when families said that they wanted this for their children. So I think as the building project moves on and, and gets uh, closer to decision points, I think we are going to have to revisit this policy because there's, yeah. there's a whole number of ways and these I spend more time than I'd like thinking about in these iterations, um, but I think it, it's hard to predict that at the moment, and our commitment would be that you know, the sibling preference for the, for the students who are in there now, that we would maintain that even if under a different scenario. Um, we'd we'd want to maintain that because that's the sort of the contract essentially that was signed when families um, did it. And, and so I think it would have to, we'd have to have a transition plan for what that looked like over time because you're gonna have some families who have siblings next year and then you're gonna have some families that are six or seven years apart. And one is, they're gonna be very different scenarios, hopefully, I'm optimistic, right? Mm -hmm. There'll be very different scenarios for each of those situations. Um, so it's something that we actively have to keep in mind as we, we go into the building project. But um, know that we are thinking about it, but it's hard to plan for, explicitly plan for that now, not knowing exactly how the building project will turn out. Mm -hmm. 
I guess I just bring it up because I feel like this is kind of a contract and that it, well, whatever we say here, we're going to have to honor. And now we have new information that we didn't have last year, at mm -hmm. least with regards to the building project, knowing that we are in the pipeline in a way and we've made a commitment towards a certain type of, not a commitment, but a, we've stated our preference through that mm -hmm. statement of interest. Yeah, so, um, so anyways, I just think that we want to keep that in mind as we're making this public commitment um, of the consequences and how it's going to play out and make things even more. Yeah. No, absolutely, it's, it is uh, on, on my mind. Okay, excellent. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And we did, you know, as part of this process, we said we would review this yearly because as it does grow each year, we're going to learn new things. Our community may change. The program may have different needs. So we will continue to revisit it also as we, as we go. Mr. Demley. So um, I might be out on, a, uh, on an island here, but um, I'd, I'd be interested if, if anyone else on the committee agrees or disagrees. Um, I'm, I'm kind of hung up on this, this, this May 4th to August 15th, 20 to 24 slots. And it's, and it's really based on, on what's, I think, really well articulated uh, later on in the FAQ about why is language considered a factor. And it talks about many other considerations are taken into account. The district commitment to social justice, our goal to, goal to close the opportunity gap for historically underserved students. And that, well, you know, while we've talked at length why this is beneficial to both Spanish speakers and non-Spanish speakers, the primary driver is to address the the achievement gap, for lack of a better term, um, for Spanish-speaking English language learners. And, and under this model, if, if you have 20 or fewer Spanish-speaking students on May 4th, and then either from Fort River or Crocker or Wildwood or School Choice, you get up to 24, then those kids can't get into the program after 20 if, they've, if we've since allowed 20 English speakers in. I don't, I, I don't like that. I don't like that the fact um, that, that that could happen to those, those four slots. And I know that's a value judgment. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but I just think that at the end of the day, um, if we're going to meet the most kids who are Spanish-speaking English language learners with this approach, that, uh, that we ought to hold that number out um, for, for those uh, students. But, you know, I'm, I'm open to other perspective, perspectives as well. Yeah, I'd be interested to hear from the committee. I don't, um, I, I would be open to that, absolutely, because of, of the same reasons that we've discussed. I think it was just kind of based on what we know the numbers average have been in the last five years, um, what we expected to see and who was in the community, that we're trying to balance that. Um, but I absolutely agree with the point that, um, that we do want to maintain that space. So I'd be open to hearing what everyone else thinks. Yeah. I, for one, would um, would agree. I, I maybe not quite as as deeply, but I, I struggled to understand sort of if we're if we're saying mm -hmm. as little as as few as twenty and as as many as twenty four to say that that's our target range. Twenty four is is our target, right? Mm -hmm. So that's so I would say you know at least until August fifteenth, holding up to twenty four seats for Spanish speaking with for groups one and group two seems logical to me but um, and then fill, and then flipping it the other way that the additional seats if we're if we're low then go to the groups three and four after August 15th but um, Dr. Morris oh Miss Spitzer I guess my only fear would be the uncertainty it would place on families who were hoping to get those slots and the probability that we might I'm just imagining a monolingual English speaking parent who might make a choice to opt out of the Emory schools or to, you know, choose the other, um, only other immersion program in the area and we, um, or, you know, might get really excited about going to Crocker or Wildwood and start building bridges there and then have to move um, after August 15th. It just, just from a parent planning perspective, I, I could see the reasoning for, um, not holding that level of uncertainty for those parents. So. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts? Yeah. Mr. Dr. Morris? Yeah, so I mean, I think I could think of another model which I think takes the feedback we've heard so far into account um, would be a little more graduated. So I can imagine us um, having kind of, if you think of the difference of the four slots from 24 to 20, um, 
opening two up on something like June 1st and, or July 1st and then another two on August 1st to assist with that. August 15th does feel late and you know, next year our school year starts late, but in some years that would be like a week and a half before school starts. And from, I understand the family planning piece. So I think it, it, we could think of maybe coming back with a proposal that tries to achieve um, opening or keeping open, maintaining more open slots for Spanish speaking students while having kind of a little bit of an earlier timeline for families. It may not be perfect, but I think we can try to approximate what that would look like um, because I, I think all the points I've heard so far are incredibly valid and we can, we can work on something. The committee would like us to. Sounds good to me. Any, any additional thoughts? I guess just a clarifying question would be if we did that, that we would still just how does school of choice play into that number and would we keep that we would only allow school choice Spanish speakers if we were under 20, but not if we were under 24? Does that make sense? So would you keep, right? Because the way it's written currently is that we would be allowing school choice Spanish speakers if we had fewer than 20 um, district-based Spanish speaking families. So. How do you feel about that question? Mr. Denley? I mean, I'll just say briefly, through all these discussions, I, I really don't see, I, I know there's different perspectives on this. My perspective is that we shouldn't be making that hard, hard of a distinction for Spanish-speaking English language learners that are zoned to Crocker or Fort River or school choice. Once you're in the district, you're in the district, in my point of view. Um, and if, you know, if, if the real value driver is to meet the needs of these students, and we have these students, that, that they should be the priority. Um, and it's, it's, it's great that there is benefit for others, but I, th I think uh, that's, that's I mean, just how I feel about it. I think I have to disagree. Just having um, had conversations with parents who are in our district with monolingual speaking kids who are extremely interested in this program and were strongly disappointed last year that they didn't have slots. I think, I'm not sure, I, I hear what you're saying, but I, 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 I wanna keep this program having broad support in the community and I think, um, I, I don't think we should go below what's recommended in terms of getting the outcomes we need for kids in our district and doing the English language learning piece and everything you said I agree with, but I, I, I don't know, I'm just, I'm just concerned about that reality. Mr. Nakajima? Yes, I feel like some more school committee members need to weigh in now. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I mean, although to be honest with you, I missed I miss the last meeting with the in-depth conversation of this, and so I feel like, um, I don't know if anyone's ever taken the LSATs or something, I feel like I'm trying to figure <laughs> out if Sally's sitting next to Peter, how many, you know, where's, where's Tina? Yep. Uh, and so I, I'm trying to catch up to exactly um, what, what all of this means. Uh, and I, I love admitting my ignorance on camera. It's always so much fun. Um, so two things. One, I like the current policy that we fill in with school, Spanish speaking, school choice students after August 15th up to the number of 20. I think the point is, I think the committee weighed in previously on that, but there was a value to ensuring that the, um, the balance in the educational program could in fact be implemented in a way that would be beneficial to all the students as, you, as we've studied. So I think that makes total sense. Um, I also think, uh, I think a graduated model, as the superintendent was describing, makes some sense because I can, I can see this one both ways. I think holding out till August 15th and creating more uncertainty among uh, families in the district doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, and it, it's, it is a funny conversation because our conversation last summer about this, from beginning to end, was all about we really hope the numbers of Spanish speaking models comes up, not the reverse. But so I appreciate the intensity of the conversation because we may get there soon, in which case it's important to have these things worked out. Um, but I also think that uh, I mean, this is a tough conversation. I'm, I'm, I know our, our former member uh, and chair constantly ask questions like, 
Where are our outreach sessions? How aggressively are we marketing the program? Are we getting the word out again? Are we getting the word out about first grade? This is where I go with um, a little bit of the, the vibe that Ms. Spitzer was describing around wanting the, the community, the entire community, to engage, celebrate, and know about this program because, hey, we're not even through our first year. We want our first year to end well. We want our second year to kick off well. We want first grade to kick off well. So this is an extremely important discussion, so don't get me wrong, but I'm actually as interested in knowing that we're really learning what we need to learn out of this first year, preparing educationally for the next year with two grades, and that we're ensuring that whatever the rules of the road are, we're doing everything we can to engage the community to get these enrollments. Anything more? No. Dr. Morris? Uh, I think uh, just on the last point, I know Ms. Richardson and Ms. Westmoreland have a, a bunch of outreach sessions being scheduled at the local preschools, including um, some of the ones that, um, the primary one that has the majority of Spanish-speaking students that come to our district. Um, and I think this gives us food for thought, and we'll come back next month with more information and a kind of more concrete proposal for your consideration. And I think the, the dialogue is helpful even when there's not agreement. I mean, sometimes I'm like, you know, superintendents, tend to be like, just tell me what you want. Um, but this, this one's a complicated set of issues, and so the dialogue actually is, is enriching for us because we have our dialogue, which is not in public, thankfully, probably for us. Um, <laughs> and we don't have cameras there, but, but I think it really mirrors a lot of the dialogue that we've, we talked about 20 and 24, we talked about August 1st, August 15th. These are all conversations that we've had internally, so uh, that feedback's really helpful for us, and uh, we'll put something together for you in February. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, so moving on to the next item, we have, um, again, budget guidance review, the Family Center. This is a discussion presentation by Family Center staff about the work of that department. Hi. So I'll do a brief introduction. I'll let Dr. Guevara introduce her team. Um, but this was one of the requests from the Amherst School Committee on budget guidance. And uh, we are trying to both um, share all the things that the committee might be interested in in, in a short amount of time. So uh, you're not <laughs> gonna hear about everything the Family Center does, because we'd be here all night, because they do a tremendous amount of incredibly essential work for our, our families and, and thus our students. Um, but you know, one of the focuses that was also around homelessness, um, that there was an interest on, so they're gonna touch on, on, on multiple things, but that's one to make sure that you're um, listening out for, and certainly the group is ready for questions. With that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Guevara. Thank you. Hi, I'm Marta Guevara. I'm Director of Student and Family Engagement for all three districts. Uh, tonight, though, I'm really excited to be sharing the work that we do uh, in the Family Center for the Amherst District, for our Amherst community. Um, and we will try to be brief. <laughs> we'll try to do, you know, give you a snapshot of some of the work we do, um, and uh, as well as give you some, we'd love to hear your questions. Um, so I'm here with my dynamic team, some of them. We have uh, Dwayne Chamble, who is our out of school time coordinator. You'll hear from everybody. We, we have two minutes each, we're gonna be quick. <laughs> we have Anastasia Morton, who's our fabulous uh, youth leadership coordinator. We have Emma Steiner. Um, also, um, Michelle Rodriguez is not here, but both of them are our Steps to Success Tier 3, which you'll hear what it is, um, case managers. We also have um, a once-a-week person, a great intervention for outreach for our Cambodian families. That's Seha Crouch, who works at both Crocker Farm and Fort River. And we have um, Mildred Martinez, who is our registrar and also our assistant. So my strategy is to read some of my comments, because otherwise I will speak all night, and we don't have time for that. <laughs> so the Family Center was established um, eight years ago, and it was um, as a response to our diverse community. We are an informational hub for all families and offer tiered support as needed. Our passion is the academic achievement of our students and our commitment is to help them and their families navigate our educational programming for their academic success. Our center is a very busy place, all day long, weekends, evenings. Um, as you will hear, we offer support for all students and families, such as with registration for all elementary schools, information about before after school programs, and many other topics, as well as a programming designed for specific needs, such as first generation families, families fleeing from violence, families um, experiencing homelessness, and many other situations. 
In terms of, um, of families experiencing home, homelessness, which was one of the priorities, we have an average of 30 families at any given time in our three Amherst Elementary schools experiencing this. It's not a number we, um, we can predict, um, but they come to us for many different reasons uh, throughout the year. We work very closely with Jesse's House as a shelter uh, for families in transition in town. We work with the Department of Children and Families and many other agencies um, to support our families through the McKinney-Vento Act, which is a federal mandate. Um, we also support families um, that are brought to us by relatives who have sheltered them because they have lost their permanent housing due to many different reasons. When that happens, the main focus is having students in school um, and identifying what they need in order for them to be safe and for their well-being. Um, oftentimes, transportation is one of the main challenges. Um, and when this happens, uh, families have the choice of staying in their home school, so wherever they were living, and or coming to school in Amherst. When that happens, we work with the Sending District to coordinate transportation and other supports. Um, we work with school staff, we work with agencies, we work with families, and uh, and supporting community agencies to meet to make sure that our families and students have what they need when they need it to be successful. Our work is to support all students, have access, be fully able to participate and benefit from our educational programming while partnering with families, school staff, and everyone contributing to that end. And now we'll have Dwayne. <laughs> Thank you. How are you doing? My name is Dwayne. How you doing? My name is Dwayne Chamble. Um, I am the out of school time coordinator for the district. Uh, my job primarily has me um, responsible for before school, after school, and summertime programming. Um, the Amherst Pelham Regional School District, well, Amherst in particular, we have a before school care program at all three elementary schools, which now services over 100 families in the, in the community, um, as well as the after school care program which I oversee the three after-school care providers that are at all three elementary schools. Um, along with that, with the collaboration that comes with these programs, um, for example, we have uh, the district um, buses that um, take the children home Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. And one of my um, responsibilities is to ensure that all kids get home safely. So I receive the all clear texts um, three nights out the week, making sure everybody's there. Um, and apart from that, going into the summertime programming, we have the Summer Academy, which runs three weeks out of the month in July, where we provide um, reading and writing intervention for four hours a day through the summer. And my job is primarily to oversee that entire program, make sure um, enrollment, registration, transportation is all there and accounted for. Um, my job, um, it's, it has a lot of different facets. Uh, parts that I really love about it is the communication, the collaboration, literally touching all different, all literally all af all, all aspects of the of the Amherst uh, school district, from transportation to uh, uh, teachers to classroom teachers and parents. And uh, uh, as far as the role and um, with the leadership of Dr. Givada, um, you know. I really think back to some of the uh, words that I got when I first started the job of treating all children like they're my ch like they're my child, my child and soon to be children will be attending the district and all the many changes that are going on. So, um, you know, I, we thank you for having us here. I thank you for having us here and look forward to the continued uh, work that we have ahead of us for all of our kids. Thank you. Okay. Hi, good evening. I can speak a lot, so I'm gonna stick to my script. So, <laughs> good evening, everyone. I'm Anastasia Morton, and I'm the Youth Leadership Coordinator for the district. Tonight, I'm just gonna share about two projects, although I can share about many. The two <laughs> I'm gonna share about are the They Made It So Can I project and working with teachers in the second year of their time in the school district. Both initiatives aim to teach students and teachers about the vast different 
pathways to success, success because it's not only one for all the students in the district, as well as the teachers understanding that for the students. So since um, the 2016, kind of the 2017 academic year, that they made it so can our project started working in the Amherst and Pelham districts. For this project, all of the sixth graders get a chance to hear from speakers that could be community partners, students from the high schools that um, went to the different elementary schools, as well as professionals in the district and college students that are in this area. Throughout this time, many speakers have got a chance to share about their sixth grade experience and how the things that they learned in middle school helped them be the professionals they are today, as well as the teachers get a chance to hear from people who didn't have the best experience in middle school, because for a lot of the sixth graders, that is their experience is middle school. So teachers and students get to say that the time that you have now really doesn't dictate where you'll be in the future, but this is a part of your life. Throughout that, students get to do hands-on activity as well as engage with dialogue with the speakers and other students in their grade. Throughout this project, I'm able to get feedback from the teachers and students on ways to improve it as well as what's going on correctly. Along with the They Made It So Can I project, I've also got to facilitate workshops and professional development for staff and administrators in the district. Recently, I've got to work with Doreen Cunningham and facilitating workshops for second year teachers. Each training has about 15 teachers from the various elementary schools. And over the past two years, students from the high school in particular have assisted with co-facilitating some of these workshops. Most recently, I got the chance to have teachers and high school students ranging from ninth grade to 12th grade get to share about times that they felt most supported and times that they wish they were more supported. Teachers really got a chance to hear from the students and engage with them on a range of listening to them in a fishbowl, but also getting to speak with them one-on-one. -on -one. I like to always end the workshops with hearing from the teachers about one thing that they took from the workshop that they didn't think about before they came in with, that they'll get to leave with, and it's always good for like the students to get to hear that, as well as the teachers to get to know things that they're doing that they should continue, and maybe things that they should pocket for later. Well, with the time that I have left, I would just like to say that this work cannot be done alone. And I am blessed with the chance to be invested with a team that encourages growth mindset, critical thinking, and self-reflection. And thank you for your time tonight. Good evening, everybody. My name is Emma Steiner. Um, as it was mentioned, I'm one of two Steps to Success case managers. Um, Michelle Rodriguez, my counterpart, is unfortunately home with a sick child, so she wishes she could be here, but sorry. Um, I will also stick to my script. Um, <laughs> as an STS case manager, we work directly with families, students, teachers, administrators, counselors, mental health teams, and staff at all three elementary schools. We work flexibly to meet each family's individual needs. Our goal is to remove barriers to student academic success, for their elementary school years and beyond. What makes us unique is that we have the opportunity to continue partnering with a particular family, <clears throat> pardon me, until their youngest child graduates from high school. We support our families in numerous ways, but a priority is helping them navigate our school systems while also supporting the understanding of our families for our school staff. We get referrals from school administrators and mental health teams for our STS program. And parents and guardians or students are always welcome to walk into our center to get one-time help or more long-term support as they would like. We work closely with various community partners, including but not limited to it by any means. LSSE, Big Brothers Big Sisters, CHD, Family Outreach of Amherst, Head Start, Center for New <coughs> Americans, ServiceNet Reach Programming, CSO and ServiceNet Counseling Services, and many others. If we don't have an answer or solution, we find it, uh, find a community resource, or fill the need ourselves as a temporary stopgap. This year, as a center, we've made it a priority to invite community partners every Friday to keep up with current information about the services um, offered and maintain our great community relationships. Um, more specifically, at each of the three elementary schools, we have weekly lunch groups of fourth, fifth, and sixth grade students. We love seeing the students in these meetings. It's so much fun. We host discussions and mini lessons, which the kids say the most incredible things. It's absolutely fascinating. Um, some topics include strengths and differences and how differences are important in our larger community. We cover growth mindset, navigating social media, which is so important these days, dealing with situations in and out of school, organization, self-care, mental health, and more. Like all of us in the ARPS Family Center, Michelle and I wear multiple hats. 
We make sure that our students and families get to benefit from all of the wonderful programming we offer within our district and our center and our community while supporting anybody who walks in. Um, especially since now we house the elementary school registrar, we're able to more directly communicate with those families who need more support either navigating our community, uh, those who might be dealing with a DV situation, or those who are considered, considered McKinney-Vento or homeless. We have developed a local resource guide to provide families um, in these cases. We have also already provided it to the counselors at each elementary school to share there as well because we recognize that sometimes they get to the schools and they might not always get to us. Um, so in sum, in the last eight years, we have and continue to accumulate knowledge, resources, connections, and community partners to benefit all district families in addition to our caseload of Steps to Success families. Thanks. And so I'll close by saying that this is just a snapshot, but we, we work, we want to stress that we work with all families. We consider all families as, as, as part of our um, caseload. And we're very thankful to the principals, other administrators, staff, all staff in the schools that partner really well. And of course the families, because they're the base of the strength. You have questions? Mr. Harrington? Yeah, um, just very briefly, I was wondering if you could uh, kind of give like a distilled synopsis of your approach to dealing with uh, homeless families. So we, when families come to us, and again, they come to us in many different ways, right? So we just get to know people. So people come in to register, or people come in through one of our agencies, or DCF contacts us and says, we're placing a student as a, in a foster home in Amherst. So there are many different realities. It's all about, you know, we want to get the student in, in school as soon as possible. We want to see what their needs are. But it's from a strength base. We don't ask questions <laughs> other than, you know, they fill out the paperwork everybody else fills. And if they share with us some information, that's our leeway in. Um, so we, we're, you know, very, very in, um, in terms of confidentiality and in terms of support and respect and honoring people as they come in. Um, we, we work with families. I, I think that's what I would say. But um, we do an intake that to determine what kinds of needs they have. Number one priority is for students to get into school, but are they safe? We have, you know, there are many different kinds of, you know, realities for, for our um, homeless families, many different categories. We have unsheltered families who have no shelter living. We have had people that we've discovered living in cars. We have doubled and tripled up families. We have unaccompanied youth. We have uh, families who come to us, um, like I said, with DCF and other agencies. So it all varies, but for us, it's a welcoming, supporting, respectful environment. And we, meet, we try to meet their needs, working with a lot of other people. Would that, is that, is that a, anything else with that? But again, we, we build relationships, and that's our most important thing. Dr. Morris? So I think Dr. Ubar is also quite modest. So I think the other thing to note that's critical, in my opinion, is that they often act as a, they being the family center staff, can act as a conduit um, to support the family in a transition. And that might be a transition mm -hmm. that's happening, a family that's in Amherst that becomes homeless. Um, it might be a family that's not living in Amherst that comes to, has the um, homeless status and then becomes a student in the Amherst Public Schools. And like any organization, uh, and that's one of the reasons we moved registration to the Family Center, mm -hmm. um, to be enveloped with support care and also to understand if families do identify needs, they can help work to help that transition. And what we know for any student transitioning to a new district or new um, housing situation can be a challenge, particularly when you add on the layers of the challenges of, of having a homeless status or being homeless. Uh, that significantly raises the stakes of the level of trauma that many of our students and families experience. And so having that additional support to ease that, that kind of the runway into starting the school year, uh, starting the year whenever it is, not always in the fall, it's, it's all year, quite literally, mm -hmm. um, is incredibly valuable and working in partnership with the schools really supports that entry for students. Now, what happens after the entry is so uh, case specific. Uh, but I do think that transition and having that smoothing and having registration being having been moved to the family center has really opened a lot of doors for families to feel supported when they first come in in a particularly um, 
unfortunate situation for many of them who uh, really uh, need these resources on the list and then beyond. And, and I think, um, as Emma stated, it's, you know, what are the resources, what are the community agencies that um, can support families, uh, and how do we um, connect the two? Because it's not always obvious for families, particularly families who are having a difficult, exper difficult experience. Sorry and to have, add, yeah, add, and we have families who become homeless, who who just lose their jobs, lose their housing, right? And just um, and trauma was mentioned before. So have experiencing homelessness, experiencing other kinds of realities, such as fleeing from violence, fleeing from domestic violence, and from war from war torn countries, undocumented families. We have a large number of undocumented families who are homeless, and again, they're, they're doubled and tripled up, and how to navigate that reality. Mr. Dem. Um, yeah, I just want to thank all of you for, for sharing your experience. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's really great that, you know, we're, we're having this meeting, you know, a day after Martin Luther King Day. Yes. You know, he talks about the network of mutuality, and I mean, y'all are, like, living that truth. That, that, <laughs> those community values we sometimes just talk ab abstractly about on the committee, you know, and it's just, it's so great to hear how we have a part of our school that supports students and families and teachers. I, I can't think of another mm -hmm. component of our schools that, that intersects all three. So um, when I, I just want to say briefly, if, if there are you know, things budget-wise that, that come up to you later on, you know, feel free to, to send them to us. We can always consider it. We're in budget season. You, you don't have to send it to this guy. <laughs> <laughs> just direct to us. We'll think about it. Thank you um, so much because in, in our vision from when we started to where we are, so when we set out our initial goals and our long-term goals, it's interesting that part of our long-term goals was a zero to three population having <laughs> our families okay. provide that. So we, were go we wanted to provide our parents, you know, uh, and guardians with the training, with the support. So there's many different ways of yeah. going, but I appreciate that. Uh, it's also good to think and yeah. to dream. <laughs> yeah, I, like one question that, that occurred to me as you were describing some of those, I mean, some really intense experiences, right? Fleeing from violence, homelessness, not knowing where your next shelter is. Um, I would imagine that, that students and families might struggle with the stigma of, of that. Yes. And uh, is, is that part of of the of the sort of teacher training and or, or and their student peer training, like what's what's the family center center's role in, in helping students? Yeah, so we provide support that. and guidance, but we are so lucky to have just incredible leadership and staff in our schools. That part of the training that we do is about welcoming all families and what that means. I will tell you that I'm a graduate of Amherst. Regional High School, I won't say from when, but what I will share is that my experience, my terrible experience when I first came here as an immigrant, um, helped design the family center vision and the work I did in, at the high school for many years because there was a stigma. You had to go to the lunchroom and give a number. Uh, I mean, give your last name and it was Guevara. You better believe that every day I'd had to say it three times. And, you know, so the reality is that we, we have to fight continuously. And for us, I mean, we are not allowed to, to not have a strength base reality with students, families, and with our staff. But I, I agree with you. I think most of the work that we do is building that relationship and trying to uh, identify what are some of those needs that families have. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they welcome it. Snacks. What? It's very important. <laughs> Snacks. Snacks. Yes. I want to explain why it's important for several reasons. <laughs> Middle schoolers, it's a transition. Mm -hmm. They're changing so, from the elementary Amherst. school. Oh, sorry, Amherst. Snacks. Yeah. It's very okay. important. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Snacks. And I, w I would just also like to add quickly as far as when you talk about the <laughs> seamless transition and the collaboration and having the registrar there in my position as the out of school time coordinator, it's been many times I get a call, Dwayne, you know, we have a family before school, after school, transportation, you know, get it all set up so that it's, you know, one, two, three, and we're giving back the family the whole package, you know, they're, they're registered in after school. I forgot to mention as well, the district subsidies, um, yes. I oversee the district subsidies for where we supply subsidies for families to attend after school to make sure that we make sure that all families have the, the, the equal and um, level opportunity to have the same experiences that all other students are having. So when you talk about the seamless transition in our different roles, you know, that's something that we, we work with right together and the family doesn't even have to, you know, worry about where's my kid gonna go, what kind of service can I have, we're already, you know, be there to provide it. So that's just one example of that seamless transition with the work. 
And something as simple as backpacks. We provide backpacks. Um, we now have a backpack fund because we started many years ago, but we have them in our office. So when we have homeless families, we're able to say, what color do you like? You know, And we offer backpacks with supplies, et cetera. Just, just something as simple as that. Just It's incredible what families say. Make them feel. Ms. Spitzer? Um, I just wanted to say thank you as well for all of the work you're doing. Um, and as somebody who's um, worked a lot on homelessness from a research perspective, I, I think we are often, when we think about homelessness, and I mean we like the, those of us who haven't experienced it, um, we often envision folks um, who we might see on the street. So the single, mm. older yeah. um, adult. And I think it's really yeah. often people don't see family homelessness. Mm -hmm. And I, I know you guys see it, and because you just told us Absolutely. over um, 30 families in Amherst. And I think anybody tuning in tonight would be kind of shocked and dismayed by that number, that it's so high. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess my question is, if, is there a... Um, do we count that at all right now? Like, I, and, and if yes. so, I feel like we should be putting this in our budget, since this is a budget meeting. Like, one of the relevant numbers for, I think, our school district is to know that not only do we serve this many students, but we serve this many students who are experiencing homelessness. And I imagine, like, the services you're providing, but also services throughout our budget that are going to support those students are not necessarily um, recognized by folks who might be reading our budget or thinking about um, the cost to our district for doing so it. This but is, also just yeah. the need. I mean, I, I, I think mm -hmm. we need to um, bring attention to this issue just because it, it's too high. And if we can't start getting attention to change, you know, more affordable housing. I mean, there are so many things that are totally beyond our control, but I think we need to be talking about it in order to start um, seeing policy changes that we need to assess this issue. Yes, so we do have to track it. This is information that we track. Again, we try to predict, but it's very hard. But um, this is information that we keep for the state, clearly. Um, there's, and we do have a budget line for McKinney-Vento, but it's one that, again, we predict. I mean, last year was an incredible year. I mean, we have to add because, again, students who, it's a great McKinney-Vento is to support and provide for those, those students and make sure that there's, try to have a seamless reality for them in terms, I mean, of transition so that students continue to get their education, families can continue to thrive, and that we work on, you know, interrupting that cycle of poverty, et cetera. Um, but the reality is that McKinney, students un, under McKinney-Vento can choose the school they go to, which is great, so they can choose to stay where they were. So these are you know, if students that we get from other places uh, or students who come to housing in Amherst can choose to stay wherever they are. The majority of them want to be with us because of our schools. Um, <laughs> but we pay, we cost share for transportation with sending districts in that regard. There, there's another category of students who are under the ca uh, custody of the Department of Children and Families that we just, this is a new reality. We're just signed on to be able to get some money back because up until now it's been an unfunded mandate that we you know have a best interest hearing by child and we determine what's you know what placement is best for that for that student and that has been on the districts we've had to pick up that whole uh, transportation and because we uh, we have to contract out with a transportation service it's about $150 per child per day so it's $75 each way. Even in a family of four, we have to pay for each student. We clearly work with our great transportation department to try to keep it in-house, but you know, it's really complicated. Um, so. Mr. Nakajima. Well, first off, thanks so much for your presentation. Um, I think what you're doing is absolutely wonderful. I'm repeating what others have said. I also would say that you're uh, even though the questions are going on for a long time, uh, you're a model. You know how you said earlier you <laughs> helped do workshops and modeling different <laughs> things for, uh, you could do the same thing for staff on doing presentations for the school committee because uh, you were really well organized. You, had, you, were, you clearly <laughs> modeled how you're a team 
Uh, so I think it was wonderful. But I mean, I, I don't want to go into it, but I thought I, there were a number of points you made around what you're doing that we could have an entire meeting on itself, and I think it's really wonderful. I would just echo something that was said a moment ago. Not when I think of how I think we have a narrative at the beginning of our budget book, um, and I think rather than putting this, there's like two different sections of the narrative. One narrative section would say, you know, we have X number of charter school students and the tuition is costing us this money. That's not where I think of this going. We have another section of the narrative that sort of describes demographic trends mm -hmm. and just sort of profiles our community, profiles who we are. And I think, I think this is a very valuable thing to put in there in the same way that um, economically distressed kids would, you know, the percentage would be worthwhile putting in there too. You know what I mean? Where we're not, we are not, I don't want to ever put it in a place where it looks like we're questioning the dollars in, value out sort of question, because that's hideous and wrong. And I know no one was suggesting that. But I'm just, I'm just, I'm just clarifying, because you mentioned like the Bikini Vento line. And I'm, I'm, I'm think, I think the, the, the request, which I fully support, is to have more of a description of just the profile of our community, but then including that, um, that segment of our population and also the other key thing is it's, it's, it's not really a segment of our population because people go in and out of homelessness and then other right. people who are not homeless go into homelessness. And you also talked earlier about this, but there's a huge percentage of, of people who are homeless or families who are homeless who are doubling up in other homes or apartments. And yes. so they're not properly sheltered. There's a huge psychological burden that, that kids carry, families carry through that process, even though they're being maybe even lovingly supported and cared for by other relatives, it places amazing burden on those families. And so I think getting an opportunity to talk about that um, in a way that allows us year to year to carry that conversation forward is a great thing to do, but also would kind of support your work. Like it, it signs attention on the kinds of things you're doing, which I think is great. And we appreciate from a strength base. So, you know, that's always a tricky conversation to have. You know, when I've been called to talk about, for example, our undocumented families, right? It's, I just want to reiterate, we're better because of our diversity. We're better because of who we are. But we're also better uh, because we're supporting all these causes and families. And, you know, so we continue having conversations about, you know, when there's no public transportation, what right, happens to these families. Um, we've done a lot with getting food to our students, you know, now, you know, universal breakfast and, you know, and, and being able to provide for them. So there's, there's a lot. We'd love to come back with more information and with questions. Yep. So thank you. I won't, I won't add anything other than thank you very much. It was really, really interesting and I'm just blown away by the amount of air traffic control that you do and I think connecting the dots for families in our community is 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 wonderful so I and I echo everything the sentiment that everybody else in the committee has said so thank you thank you so much okay. so we're about 45 minutes behind at this point um, and moving on to our next topic is the Crocker Farm School Improvement Plan update, a discussion and presentation from Crocker Farm about the implementation of your improvement plan from last spring. Hi. So I can very briefly introduce Assistant Principal Smith and Principal Shea from Crocker Farm. Uh, I think they will follow the tradition or the, the path that was set with a relatively brief number of slides uh, that's trying to encapsulate a tremendous amount of work and information. And uh, just, just again to talk about the purpose of this is that last year all three elementary schools uh, presented school improvement plans to the school committee last spring and what we committed to is, is each school will provide an annual update to the committee of how's the work going, what course corrections uh, or adjustments need to be made and, and a summary of the work. So in the packet you can see the slides and um, in the school committee packet in particular because it was a lot of pages so we did we were trying to also be sustainable. Um, there was additional information that the school provided about some of the work particularly as it relates to social justice. So with that I'll turn it over to the administrator's Crock firm. Um, sorry. Good evening. Uh, um, Let's see, so it's eight o'clock. I'm actually uh, much better at five o'clock in the morning. Um, <laughs> you're in your 50s, you kind of go to bed at 8.30. Um, so I apologize if, anyway, first thing I want to say was, um, I want to say hello to Mr. Harrington and uh, thank you, welcome. It's good to see you, Ben. Uh, can I say that you're a Crocker Farm parent? I'm allowed to say that, I just said it. Absolutely, <laughs> proud. <laughs> <laughs> 
So, uh, thank you, Ben. Good to see you. Um, uh, I'll just say a couple of quick words and, and then uh, we'll get rolling. So, um, I just uh, wanted to say something I was hoping we wouldn't talk about tonight. You certainly can ask us if you want, but I was just hoping we could talk about it some other time. I think I was watching on TV a little while ago, and I think one of the things that came up uh, in reference to our lovely little school was some dialogue about MCAS stuff. And so, um, Jen and I were actually talking about that, and we'd be more than happy to come back some other time and talk about MCAS. We're not actually here to present about MCAS tonight. We're here to present about the School Improvement Plan. But we'll see what happens if you ask us about that stuff. Um, I just think it's a complex conversation that probably comes some other time. Um, uh, just quickly, and I think I spoke about this before. So I've been here. This is my 23rd year here working in the Amherst Schools, uh, and I'm very proud of that, uh, that number. Um, over the course of the, the, the time that I've been here, 22 and a half years or so, I've uh, worked through a variety of iterations of school improvement plans and I think um, school improvement plans are, are these sort of documents that often gather uh, dust type things and it's usually because what happens in the beginning is a small number of people get involved and there's a, usually a principal and sometimes an assistant principal small number of other folks and it never really gets the traction or the energy that it deserves and so we've tried our best and I think we are actually uh, doing something a little bit different this time in that the plan itself involved all of our staff and the plan itself involved a large number of our community members and then what we'll talk about in a minute is the plan actually involves the leadership and the direction of all of our teachers so it's not just like a principal or an assistant principal or some other person who's telling people what to do. We'll talk about it in a second. The way that we've tried to structure this work is that everyone in our school, and particularly probably about 25 or 30 teachers who help leading the work in this, are actually the ones that are responsible for, for the implementation. Um, we, we do like to get money and support and people coming from outside to, to assist us, but I think one of the things that we've realized and learned is that Inside our building and inside our community lies a lot of the answers to the questions that we have because we've got a lot of very talented, bright people. So that's what we'll talk about in a second is what the sort of talented, bright people in our school are doing to help us with the implementation of our plan. Okay, so as we shared last spring, our school improvement plan is really driven by three major goal areas. One around equitable, engaged learning, one around building stronger relationships, and two, one about just supporting healthy, happy, resilient kids. And so in August, we formed three committees that really are driving the implementation of these goals. One committee is the Engaged Learning Committee, one being the Well-Being Committee, and then one the Social Justice Committee. And tonight we're just going to briefly share with you what those committees are doing to help drive the collective goals forward. So the first committee is the Engaged Learning Committee, and to date they have facilitated four staff meetings around the tenets of universal design for learning. So teachers have learned about what are the barriers to instruction. They brainstormed different barriers. They've looked at and examined grade level data. They've thought about different ways that kids can show what they know. And they've also thought about new strategies to help support kids to set their own learning targets. So in every staff meeting, teachers have learned new strategies in action. They've had opportunities for small group discussion and they've been able to give the committee feedback about their learning and what they want to know so that they're driving what the committee is engaging the staff with. So these are just two of many examples of what staff, after staff meetings, what teachers have done to apply what they're learning from just the teachers talking about what they've done and tried. So these are two examples of teachers doing goal setting with students, one around writing and then one around um, reading and decoding. Um, I think I'm just going to say a quick couple of words about our well-being committee. So uh, last summer, uh, three of our staff members uh, uh, went to a training that was, I think, held by perhaps Suffolk Law School through the collaborative, don't really remember the exact specifics, but they went to a training that really was looking at the tenets of uh, restorative practices, restorative justice. These are all words that have been sort of hanging around for a number of years. We've actually been using them in our school for a number of the years, and we were really, the people went to the training, brought back the work, and, and what we've been doing, I think perhaps four or five different staff meetings Actually, that's one of the books that's up there. I've got a number of other books that we're utilizing. Is that what we've been doing is actually saying um, this whole notion of like what happened 
who was harmed, how are we going to make it better? This is a, 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 a way of sort of trying to, to deal with when challenging situations arise in school. And one of the things that we realized is that teachers themselves, and that's a, a photograph of some of our lovely teachers up there, teachers themselves need to be well versed in the notion about what restorative practices and restorative circles are. And so we've actually been uh, sitting with the, the teacher leadership group and actually practicing how to do restorative circles. Um, we're almost in a circle here right now, right? So you've got this idea that everyone can see each other and everyone can sort of speak one another and sort of get a feeling for, for how people are experiencing the situation. And so it's not an easy task, uh, some fantastic learning and, and many more, uh, I think, meetings to come in that work. Okay. okay, and so the Social Justice Committee has met seven times since August. It will be eight after tomorrow because oh. we're meeting tomorrow after school. Um, and really what we've been able to do is really learn about teaching tolerance anti-bias framework and an equity literacy framework. We've also had two full day workshops with the former senior manager of teaching and learning at Teaching Tolerance. And there really are two main essential questions that are guiding our work together. One is about how do we affirm identity, celebrate diversity, teach justice, and inspire action. The other one is, what is our equity vision for our kids in classrooms and our school? So really, the, the social justice standards from teaching tolerance have really like, propelled and launched us into the learning that we're doing around supporting students' identities and helping them to be their full selves when they come to Crocker Farm, creating classroom environments that reflect diversity, equity, and justice, engaging families in culturally sustaining ways, and how do we as staff speak up and encourage students to speak up against injustice and bias? We had a great opportunity in December on our early release day to really, as a staff, focus our learning around supporting students' identities and making them feel safe at school. And Hillary Montague from Safe Schools at the Stonewall Center engaged our teachers and paras in grades kindergarten through third around best practices to support to serve our LGBTQ students. And then meanwhile, teachers were working in, in pairs in fourth through six around the same topic, but through the lens of our health and wellness curriculum that's targeted at, at those upper grades. And it was a pretty amazing time for everybody to actually really be our teachers, our pairs, our staff, everybody in the building be like taking the time to work on this stuff. So next steps for the committee is really to continue to meet regularly, discuss, apply what we're learning, but really begin to start action planning around how are we gonna replicate this work with staff, our families, and the community moving forward. I'll just add two quick things. So here's a couple of just examples. Uh, those are some of our lovely people again. Um, there's two quick examples of something that just even, because it's hard to actually sit here and talk to you about school when, and, and, and I've said this a number of times, you're more than welcome to come sometime to a staff meeting or to come and just walk around with us for an hour or with other people for an hour. You get a little bit more of the sense of the culture and the energy and the buzz and the, the, the atmosphere. But just two things I'll mention briefly. So today's Tuesday, so on Thursday night, we're hosting an event in our library. Uh, Miss Santiago is our librarian, our uh, third year librarian, and, and she's got an amazing website. I meant to send it to you all and I forgot, but I'll send you her website. Um, and so what we're trying to do on Thursday night, for example, is we're inviting families to come in um, to look at this sort of massive variety of books that we have in our library that sort of tackle like all sorts of in incredible pieces about who we are as, as, as individuals in this world. This is a PGO sort of uh, sponsored event through our social justice group um, and then we're trying to again bring families in take a look at what the books that we have and actually use our library as a library so that people can come and pick up books and so that's just a little, a little snippet of something I'll just tell you something else quickly here's a good example you probably all approved this a few weeks ago someone who's a former teacher in a school said I'm going to give you 800 bucks right and the teacher said here's what I want you to do with 800 bucks I want you to spend the money and I want you to go around and make sure that a whole bunch of kids in your school who I used to work with or who perhaps are populations I work with make sure that they we get them registered and enrolled in some activities that are taking place in town right so over the last couple of weeks one of my counselors and one of my teachers and then someone who works in the office if you go on a Saturday morning or a Sunday morning you go for and I went this Saturday morning to the middle school to watch like the sonic bobcats versus oh the sonics versus the bobcats right it was a 10:15 kickoff or 
tip-off, whatever you want to call it, basketball. And so the goal was to spend the money, right, to go in our school and to make sure that we get as many kids as possible who don't ordinarily sign up and go and participate in events to go and actually sign up and participate, right, and to work on getting car rides and practicing the various things. So, so when you come to school on a Monday morning or a Tuesday morning, right, you can get involved in the dialogue and the conversation with those pieces. Just a small little piece there, right, but it means a huge piece. And Ben knows what I'm talking about, right, because you run in that circle, right, where you're constantly sort of involving kids. I went Saturday morning, I was watching Crocker Farm after Crocker Farm and all sorts of different teams. Just a little piece, but that's the sort of energy and the sort of feeling that we're trying to get is this sort of collaboration and connection. We're happy, um, I know you all get talked at a lot at night, but we're happy. <laughs> I don't know how you'll do it, but um, maybe if there's a question or two. Any questions? Mr. Demling? Um, so I, I like the, the, uh, what you described structurally about how involving as many people as possible in the input and the output so that you're not just, um, uh, doesn't, ju doesn't just collect dust. You know, I, I, back in my Crocker days, I, I worked on some things that maybe eventually collected dust. Yeah. So I know what you're talking about. Yeah. So I like the approach. It's good. Um, Mike was there also. <laughs> <laughs> um, Share the blame. Uh, I, I love the description of a lot of the stuff you're doing. One, one thing I found intriguing uh, when you're talking about uh, teaching tolerance and working with uh, K-3 to for uh, LGBTQ um, uh, lifestyle and values and, and, and supporting students. Um, it, it's funny. Like, I almost think like it's inverse when we talk about teaching tolerance, that the younger they are, the more they already are there. <laughs> and it's just a matter of encouraging the values they already have. It's like the adults that really need the, to be taught. Um, so like, what, like, what does that look like um, in, a, in like a real like experience kind of way when you're, when you're engaging children that young on, on values um, that adults get wrong, but young children seem to some, often, you know, intuitively um, have that? That tolerance problem. Yeah, so what is really helpful is that teaching tolerance has the social justice standards are broken up by grade level bands, so kindergarten through second and three through five. So it helps guide teachers to make sure that we're teaching in more of like a systematic, developmentally appropriate way. So in kindergarten through second grade, it would be about just supporting kids' identity, understanding that it's okay to have multiple perspectives and come from different places and asking. Um, appropriate questions for differences, right, and teaching kids how to ask, ask questions, also, also while affirming their own individuality. Yeah, I, I think one of the things that, uh, it, it, so we've uh, done some interesting work on, 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 on uh, matters related to sort of transgender uh, uh, members of our community, and, and so Hilary uh, Montague, who came to us from the Stonewall Center, she actually uh, is I think, hired by Desi to come in, and it wasn't cost any money, she essentially worked for Desi. So, so on a practical level, you've got a, a, a person called Hillary who comes in and actually is trying to educate the adults in her building, the staff, about matters that sometimes my, four, well, not 14 anymore, but my younger daughter knew, knows more about matters than sometimes adults do. So here's an example of a conversation when we were in, in, our, in, in the meeting that Hillary came with, with staff members where people were debating the merits of whether or not teachers should have um, uh, gender specific groups for lunch with their students. So should a teacher be saying, there was a, third, there was a, a, a dialogue discussion saying, should I invite all the quote boys to come and have lunch with me? Because what does that mean and, and who identifies and who gets left out and what does that mean for someone who's perhaps not? So fascinating conversations taking place with adults to try and help our learning curve get sharper and stronger. Mm -hmm. Mr. Nakajima. Thank you. I love hearing about it. Um, I love what you guys are doing. I think it's wonderful. Um, one question I have is whether you're hearing what you've heard back or whether it's, I don't know if it's too early, for what you've heard back from the staff around how this work is affecting practice. Mm. And also just how you're thinking about that because, I mean, to me, when you're doing something that's sort of this organically directed. And I remember last year we were talking mm -hmm. about the fact that there's a huge correspondence between where you were going and what the identity and what the, the work of Crocker already was and that this is an, sort of a natural outgrowth of it. And so one of the questions that comes up to me is that before one talks about sort of 
broad structural or programmatic impacts and things that look really great when you're breaking it out with headers and subheadings and an outline is just what you're learning and what you're gathering from, from that practice uh, from the staff and your colleagues and, your, and both of you yourselves. Yeah, so I think that's a great question. One, I think you have a, an example of a staff survey in your packet of materials that I think I sent in, which was from November, which is just kind of taking the pulse of where teachers are at. But I just, you know, can just speak to what I see is that I see a lot of teachers being like, oh, right. Google, like using Google apps, like Google Read and Write, and when we're projecting something, video images always put the subtitles on. It's just like these little shifts to instruction that are more inclusive. And when we were able to like think about just like what are potential b barriers to instruction, the dialogue around staff and then, then staff going and doing, and then we have 8 a.m. meetings that are structured, so when we do problem solve around k kids and cases, the what teachers are bringing to the table, what, what they're trying and what they're doing is ideas that they've gotten from staff meetings. So anecdotally, I can say that I, I have seen teachers just do these minor shifts. I think it would be interesting to kind of collect some more information about impact. Yeah, and I, and I think the thing I would say, that, uh, and I'm, I'm just looking at some faces up there in the picture who have actually, um, two people are sitting next, next to the one another. One of them is a fourth grade teacher and the other is a first grade teacher. And the fourth grade teacher had actually presented some work in the staff meeting. And then the next day, the first grade teacher was in the classroom trying her best to implement it with her first graders, right? And so there's this hunger for people to learn from one another. And, and so I think the, 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 what they were working on in the, in the, the meeting was uh, fourth grade writing goals, right? Mm -hmm. How do you help students yep. set appropriate goals and targets for the writing and so then the first grade teacher getting this long conversation with the fourth grade teacher after the meeting about how I could try something different tomorrow in class right and so I think there is this sort of hunger and desire and willingness and, and openness for people to to work with one another and learn from one another right we all have strengths weaknesses you know whatever it may be I have one more, one more thing mm -hmm. I'm develop it. and so um, thinking about this um, are you how are you thinking about identifying I mean, sort of there's two different levels of thinking of outcomes. Remember, one of the things we talked about last year was, you know, how are you going to measure change, whatever your goals and right. benchmarks and things like that. And I think that's valuable, so I'm not trying to just punt and put that aside. But I'm also trying to think that if you have a strong, broad participation, whole staff sort of participation in this work, that's really uh, draining and can feel endless, and which means you also have to have moments where you can identify some level of success and without necessarily singling out individuals. I'm not thinking, and something like group activity like this, I'm not thinking of it in terms of saying like you give one individual an award for improvement or something, because that sounds like to totally opposite of what you're trying to do. But, but there's, there's got to be some way to celebrate and acknowledge mm -hmm. and identify that if you're doing this work and you're having something like 21 or 24 meetings uh, or 30 over the course of a year, um, what feels good and what feels successful in a way that also resonates with your staff. So instead of it being like getting like, you know, a sticker for an accomplishment, there's actually some translation between what you've been trying to accomplish, what you've been talking about, and things that people can feel that they've experienced in their change work environment and success. I'm just wondering how you're thinking about that. Well, you know, when I was in the classroom and being in the reading specialist for a number of years, I think what was really motivating and what I see is most motivating for teachers is when they try something and it works and they see that like, oh, for kids, that like access point and I see a lot of that happening right now and I think we've the the committee and Derek and I've really tried to support a manageable amount of of things that teachers are learning so instead of 30 meetings with all new things it's like 30 meetings getting deep in talking about three or four things right and so I think providing the space and time for teachers to celebrate successes is really important and we do it before every staff meeting. And I think what's motivating teachers to try it is because they see success with it. Yeah, and the thing I would just say again, and you perhaps, you know, you get this yourselves if you're feeling like you've got unity in your, in your group here, is that, is that, again, I'm just reflecting and looking at, because again, when I look at the photograph up there, I know the story behind lots of 
the, 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 the photograph up there is that people have this hunger and desire to learn, but they also have a hunger and desire to learn together and with other people. And I think there's a sort of energy that you see from people. I, I, again, we're not, we thought, I'm not getting the nuts and bolts here, we're not paying people extra money. Occasionally you may get a day to do some work in the summer for this, but we're not paying people large chunks of money to, to actually do this work. People are doing it because they see that it's actually part of what our school is about and, 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 and it's a, so there's a drive to that. So I think, again, as, as someone who comes from like a team background, I, I, I feel like there's a, there's a piece of this that is sort of team driven for, for the right reasons. Dr. Morris? Yeah, just to add two things, uh, and I think it's a great question and I appreciate the responses. Uh, at a broad, no, it's right on. At a broader level, um, the current commissioner of education has talked, uh, every, his stump speech, um, which I'll hear again Thursday, I'm sure, will be that we've gotten as far as we can get collectively with the standards movement. And there's a, there's a group of teachers in our state who is looking for someone to unleash the collaborative learning that's gonna bring them to the next level. And that uh, for too long, and I'm not saying this is true necessarily in Amherst, but too long statewide, the focus has been on standards MCAS, standards MCAS, standards MCAS. And uh, there was some reason, in his opinion, there's some good reason for that. And uh, it's taken away from some of this other critical work that's really affirming. Um, the other thing, and, and I can send this out if anyone's interested, there's um, PDK is an organization, they do an annual survey of teachers and communities. It, it's often known most famously for uh, that everyone ranks their school really well in terms of parents. They rank their district schools lower and they rank the nation's schools terribly. But like that happens everywhere. So they have this really weird national data set where uh, people in general are really happy with their schools no matter where they live, no matter the achievement scores of their schools. They're slightly less happy with the other schools in their district and just horrified at the nation's schools. Um, so it gets a lot, and that, it's, like a, it's been going on, it's a longitudinal survey, it's been going on for like 30, 40 years. And so one of the things that um, they talked about in this year's themes, 2019 I should say, because it came out in the fall, was about uh, what um, teachers leaving the workforce. And so there's some predictable things, particularly in certain areas of the country, South, Midwest, with salaries, um, which is it's certainly, it's not that it's not true in the Northeast and the West, but it's less prevalent. But one of the big things is, is the ability to collaborate and feel like they're part of uh, a collective enterprise, that it's not um, independent contractors who are sharing a parking lot. And, and that really matters for morale, it really matters for a stability of staff and staff members staying in the position um, and transiency of, of teachers, either within, between schools or districts, but also within the field. So I think, I think it's a great question, I appreciate the answers, but I wanted to support uh, the responses that there's, there's both national data as well as statewide emphasis right now on doing the critical work that they're describing. Ms. Spitzer? I just um, couldn't not say thank you very much. Um, I think I predate everybody here in that I was actually a student at Crocker Farm um, before the MCAS, and I think it's nice to see that we are, um, you know, when I was there, there was this tradition still of um, you know, I was there under pa when Paul Wiley was the principal, and I, I still remember like the MLK Day celebration. Yep. So, um, just thank you for continuing the good work. So, um, thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. I won't add to it. We were already so far behind. It. Thank you so much. It was really. So I'm feeling handicapped at my very first meeting that we're so far behind <laughs> on this agenda. <laughs> We've been um, trying. <laughs> yes. I feel better about the fact that you didn't make this agenda, the superintendent's out. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we'll see if we can uh, get through the others. There uh, is one vote tonight, um, but the rest are, are truly updates. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, so moving along, we're moving to capital plan discussion. Um, and again, it's a discussion, revised capital plan document. So uh, thank you, Mr. Roy Clark, and I'll just do a very brief introduction. There's two pages. One is focused on capital requests and work that's currently being completed and um, has been completed or will be completed. Yes. And the second is the draft capital plan requests. Uh, the agenda topic really focused on the requests, but um, I talked to um, Mr. Roy Clark and felt really strongly that both for the committee but also the community, when we talk about things in the future, we don't often talk enough about things that we're currently doing. And so 
uh, sort of however the chair would like us to approach that, whether it's a document that just briefly went over, because we'll try to be brief, uh, we can do that, but that, that was an inclusion of my request because I thought it was really important to honor the work that's happening. Uh, in terms of the capital request for the Amherst Public Schools, the process is that there is no vote taken uh, as, as of compared to the regional schools. There's feedback offered and revisions can be made. And then at an upcoming meeting, which we'll get to at the very end of the agenda, there'll be two representatives of this body that serve on a joint capital planning committee. That is a townwide committee that includes representatives from other town departments. And they make uh, collective feedback and de uh, collective decisions to bring to, in this case, a town manager and the town council on which projects can be funded. Um, so I just want to lay that out because it's really different from the regional process where this formal vote's taken. This is really um, where we are and our recommendations. We can take questions and feedback on anything in the list or anything not on the list uh, and, and come back with any revisions. But the goal, since JCPC will start meeting next month, is um, in relatively short order, uh, making sure that the committee, and particularly those two members who sit on JCPC, have the information they need um, to, to go with there, um, to go to JCPC and, and advocate on behalf of the schools. Longer introduction I was planning. Sorry, Mr. Roy Clark. Um, but maybe if you could just briefly go over um, some of the highlights of the request, but mostly focus on the, uh, on the projects that are being completed, but mostly focus on the request for FY21. Sure, let me see if I can do this in three sentences. <laughs> Uh, but first, uh, I want to say it's really amazing to sit here and see all the incredible work that uh, has been shared with you before my time here, and it's really, uh, it's really thrilling to be part of the district. I'm coming up on my one-year anniversary now. Uh, it seems like it's been a lot longer, but it's just time is flying by. Um, so um, in, your in your documents, you've got a, a rough list of some of the bigger projects that are in the works or have happened, um, this document here, and I'm trying to not make it be complete and all-inclusive, but to give you a flavor of what's going on. You'll see that um, the second half of the list is uh, thing, mostly things that we're gearing up to try to uh, have take place this summer, um, whereas the first half of the list is stuff that's uh, already happened or is a repeat item that's going to be happening seasonally or is ongoing. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions about any of these or anything else. Uh, on the other side, uh, with the draft capital requests, I want to emphasize this is a draft. This is still a work in progress, and I apologize for the typos. Um, uh, we really tried to pare down our capital requests this year. We know that, that the school system is looking to uh, have some big expenses with, with the um, MSBA project and a bunch <coughs> of other things. Um, uh, so this is really slimmed down, and you'll see that um, most of the stuff, the all Amherst schools, is spread out across all three schools. Um, and uh, there are a couple of things that are specific to transportation or, or to uh, some individual schools, but mostly it's, it's district-wide for the Amherst schools. Um, and. Um, some of it is uh, project specific, a lot of it is ongoing kind of um, capital needs that we have and that you see every year. And with that, I'll um, respond to questions. I'm going to add two or three pieces of, of sure. detail if that's Absolutely. okay, Mr. Roy Clark. So uh, I want to um, highlight, even though it's, and I appreciate your description because I think it would really clarify. Um, it used to be like one thin line if you remember the old capital plan, so I appreciate the, the, the additional description you put into the document. Um, but one of the pieces that we know and literally MSBA commented on when they were uh, visiting in the fall was the Fort River roof and, and what we would do. So uh, this $70,000 request um, is beyond patching. Um, it's really looking at, at, at roof replacements that can get us to the five to seven years, five to eight years there. Um, I think we've gotten to where we can get to with patching. And it's uh, sort of complicated because there's brittle there's, um, mm -hmm. aspects of the roof. Mm -hmm. uh, but we feel like the additional money will, will get by us the time that we need for this MSBA project to play out uh, without having the full replacement, which is over, you know, it's in the seven-digit range uh, for the roof. I think the only other thing I wanted to comment on, uh, and again, it is in the text, 
is both the asbestos management and the interior upgrades. One of the things when we talked about air quality um, in our schools that we're attempting to do and did successfully last summer at, the, at Wildwood was ripping up carpet and putting in tile or putting down a different surface that doesn't have carpet. And anytime we do that, we have to be conscious of asbestos management. So when people see the word asbestos, people go to a different, in the public can go to a different place. And I've been very clear that um, my knowledge base on this is very low, though increasing. Um, and so what that is, is if we're going to, in the summer, uh, rip up carpeting and take apart rooms and then put them back together with either tile or some other surface, we, need, we we're likely to have some asbestos management to be, that needs to accompany that. So it's not in response to an emergency right now with asbestos, it's that if we want to do the critical work that we feel like has the um, highest yield on improving air quality in our schools, that that has to go along with it. So I just, I figure I might get some questions about that one, so I figured I'd try to head that one off. Hi. Hello. Thanks for the update on the uh, current. I appreciate the inclusion of the current projects, uh, as well as the new ones. A um, couple things. One uh, is the seventy thousand for the Fort River roof. All that we think we need to do, in addition to the roof, to fix it to make it usable for the next five to eight years, or is that like the first tranche of of a couple of repairs? So um, a couple of years ago, I think we got uh, something like $30,000 in a capital article request uh, to do some repairs to the roof. And uh, the responsible bids were all up around 80,000 uh, for that work that Jim McPherson had spec'd out. Um, uh, my current plan, subject to change, is to focus on uh, two of the major problem areas that we have in those roofs. One is where the roof drains sit and getting having leakage around the drains going down into the rooms. And the other is the multiple valleys and where the seams are in the multiple valleys when snow and slush collect. Uh, so the, the, the intention is to focus on those two components. Um, redoing the, the collection system and, and the um, spreading out as wide as we can, I think it's uh, 10 feet wide in each valley, a new layer. Um, it, um, as, as Dr. Morris had suggested, there's some issues with how you bond the new layer to the old layer underneath without ripping it up. Um, but most of the splits and damage that we have is in those, in those two areas. So this isn't, I mean, no, there's no such thing as a roof guarantee. You know, you're gonna have a roof that, that could leak uh, this is addressing the major problem issues, and it's my belief that we'll still have some leaks and still have some patching where those new versus old seams fail. Um, but this should make the roof way more reliable and last uh, five to eight years. So it's the major item. And the second question I had for you was um, on the on the plow truck. Yes. I guess do. I mean, I, I guess the way it works is the trucks are. Like we're all part of the town, so technically they're probably all the town's truck. But um, is is the plow truck exclusively used by the elementary schools or the schools, or is it a shared resource with the rest of the town? The um, all of our most of our vehicles are owned by Amherst and shared. Uh, there are some uh, vehicles that have been bought by uh, the district. And the one that we're replacing, I don't remember. I, I, I hesitate to say which one that is. I think it was an Amherst vehicle. Um, I'd, I'd love to, I mean, let me give you the advice. For whoever from the Amherst School Committee, including possibly myself, who ends up sitting on JCPC, you will know, want to know the answer to that question. Yes. Yep. Because you yep. can't advocate for the truck unless you understand how it fits in with the rest of the rest of the fleet that the town uses and what the replacement schedule is for those vehicles. Right. So I'm just, I, I didn't know, we, I mean, if we had one, I didn't know we had a plow truck for the Amherst schools. That's kind of cool we do. So, um, sorry, it, yeah, if, took up enough time. Can I, can I give you a little bit more information? So this is one of our many pickup trucks. We use it year round, we throw a plow on it in the, in the winter time. Um, we sometimes throw sander on one of the trucks, but our sander is dyed as well. Um, so these vehicles are all used by um, school personnel as opposed to town personnel. Um, so the, the driving is all done, the main, maintaining is all done um, within the school system. 
Um, it's not a heavy duty plow truck like you think of with the town with the great big plow trucks that do two lanes at once. It's not that kind of a truck. Mr. Demling. Um, so first, I, uh, per our recently adopted uh, school meeting policy, I moved to extend our scheduled meeting time a half an hour from 8.35 to 9.05. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Okay. So moved. Thank you. <laughs> Can I continue? Yes. <laughs> have, I, have I earned a question? Yes. <laughs> um, thank you for the asbestos comment. Um, I am still wondering though why it says this includes essential emergency repairs. Um, so if you could explain what that is. Um, and, and also, um, so I understand that, you know, given the MSBA um, hope that we get this building, uh, five or six years from now, or, or more, um, that, that, that this has slimmed down. I'm interested to know, like, what has slimmed down? You know, like we've talked before about, you know, we're now in this era where we're going to have no easy choice about do we invest in a building for current student experience uh, that we hope you know, is gone in five or six years. And so I'm, I'm wondering what's dropped off the list for those. Why don't I answer the second one, or I can start the second one. Um, and certainly Mr. Roy Clark will have to answer the first one. So uh, we're continuing renting the chiller instead of replacing the chillers at, um, and the systems at Fort River and at Wildwood. Some of the ADA upgrades we're still going to do. There's still going to be children and staff there for the next five to seven years. But I think we're trying to think about what are the highest yield um, fixes we can make, uh, given that we don't imagine these schools to be operational long term. And even if there's a renovation chosen, um, you might say, oh, well, things will still be in place, but they may not, right? The, the fix you make may not survive a renovation, so you can't bank on kind of that model as well. Uh, those are the two that came most acutely to mind. I don't know if there's others that you can think of. So we've been planning to uh, replace the Wildwood and the Fort River chillers with modern chillers, and that's been kicked down the road. So that, like you say, we're trying to limp along with uh, supporting the, the one chiller we have. Same is true with, um, with generators. Uh, we had uh, been planning to um, upgrade our generator systems for those elementary schools and we're um, trying to limp along with those without a big, a big upgrade on those. Um, I think and I parking think lots, the, yeah, go ahead. Parking lot was the other one. Yes. Um, and the Fort River roof. Those are the big ticket seven digit items yep. that, uh, six or seven digit items that we're gonna try to forestall if we can. Um, sorry. I, that was fine. I was parking lots was next on my list. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I had a quick question that kind of builds on, on what Mr. Demling was, was um, asking about, which is what would be helpful is to understand how this compares to our current, current capital. Um, so we list the projects, but not the total dollar amount. And then getting at exactly this question is sort of looking at the go forward, the projection out um, in the next five years, what does that look like so that we can understand and then also build this story for JCPC conversation about how this um, request compares to, to future years and how sort of we're, you know, it sounds like we're tackling the big ones now and, and sort of expecting sort of a significant drip off um, after, after this year. But I think painting that picture and having that for this discussion would be helpful. Yes. Just one other piece, and then we can loop back to Mr. the first question that Mr. Deming had, is um, that I think the other reason that we opted to include the prior page of capital requests is um, Mr. Roy Clark has made a very complex chart um, for me about, um, at my request, so thank you for humoring me in that, um, the last five or six years capital requests, what's been spent, what's left? Because the, the, the thing with capital requests, and we had time period without a facility, two time periods where we didn't have a facilities director, is that um, some of it was deferred maintenance based on capacity and, and human power, and some of it uh, was just making sure that we're catching up on uh, all the requests that were granted over the last couple of years. And there were, a couple of years back, there were um, some projects that um, hadn't all been spent. So we're also trying to be good stewards from the town perspective um, of making sure that uh, the money we have either goes back to the town or it gets spent. And so some of what you see on the capital request and the facilities report um, isn't just last year's requests. It's, it goes back um, a little beyond there. And I think it's just important to note that some of the catch up is needed. And that's, that's typical. That's not atypical for both school districts. And it'd be the same on the town side um, that you, you request something and sometimes things happen and they don't always happen in the, the fiscal year, the next fiscal year. Uh, but we're doing a lot of catch up and work on that. And I just applaud Mr. Roy Clark for being his structure and organization uh, for that. And, and that's also part of the equation as well. 
Yeah, and just to uh, amplify that, if I may, that, uh, I think it's fair to say that um, you know there are areas where uh, we're behind on spending, and so I didn't want to ask for the same amounts this year. So some of those lines are omitted this year that would have been an annual, uh, and some of them have been reduced. So that's a, a another component. I had a question that we didn't answer yet about asbestos removal. So, um, the emergency. right. So, um, if there were an asbestos emergency, we would want to be able to attack it right away and not uh, go through a lengthy process of, of getting the money together. So, it's critical to have uh, a pot of money that's there available for such an emergency. Um, we haven't had any since I've been here. Um, We've had some urgent needs. There was a, um, uh, some piping in one of the elementary schools that we needed to fix a valve on, but we couldn't until it was abated. It was uh, above the ceiling where it was not affecting anybody, but, um, uh, but at any rate. So that was something that wasn't necessarily planned, but it wasn't an emergency. It wasn't a project per se, uh, but it came up and we needed to deal with it right then and there. Does that yeah. sort of give you a sense? Yeah. Did you? I just, yeah. Um, one question, um, going back to the truck. Oh, sorry. I, I just, for the, for the sake of those who worry about asbestos in the schools, um, by state law, we have uh, a three-year review of all of our schools uh, that have asbestos-containing materials, and every six months, uh, we have an outside firm come in and check for any issues that are there. So it's something that's always being looked at. It's being looked at by outside independent uh, experts. So uh, hopefully people will feel reassured that we are taking it seriously. Excuse me. Thank you. Um, so just going back to the truck, um, I know there's been a lot of conversations in the community and also the town council just um, approve measures to reduce our carbon footprint. So I'm just wondering, kind of in, in anticipation of feedback on, on, on this from the community, have we looked at any um, electric vehicles? I know that the DPW just got a grant to get one. And this kind of makes me think about what um, cool. Eric was mentioning. If it's an Amherst truck or if it's a um, school's truck, it might um, influence how how it plays out in the long term. So far as I know, there aren't um, uh, electric pickup trucks that it would be useful for this purpose. Um, but I'm happy to be educated, and I'll reach out to Guilford and see what he can tell me. Um, uh, you know, we could look at a hybrid to reduce um, some of the carbon footprint. Um, more and more companies are coming out, but we're likely going to get something that's the first the first year of, of, of a model, which is always a little bit of a risk for maintenance, um, but we could certainly look at that. Um, I think it would end up costing more money, um, and so that's something we would need to discuss further. Yeah. And, and I do think getting then, just anticipating that folks are going to be asking these questions, it's helpful to have those numbers in our back pocket and, and have an answer, um, even if we're not officially asking for um, the higher figure. Absolutely great feedback. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Nakajima? I totally agree. And I think that, and I think your point about hybrid as well as electric, look at both. Get, I mean, get answers for all of that so that, we, you know, we can look at it, basically, and figure out what we think. Um, that wasn't what I was going to ask you, though. Um, wasn't there something, we t I remember, like, last year, and Allison might remember this, the chair might remember this. We had like an endless conversation about certifying our electrical systems. And then at the end of that certification, we were going to get back a response of all the stuff we needed to potentially fix to make it last a long time and all that kind of stuff and be safe and wonderful. I'm, I'm compacting it and simplifying the language because I feel like it. Um, I don't see that on the list. So I'm just wondering, did that get dropped off at some point around December 11th or? What's going on? Mm, yeah, uh, I thought I had it in the list on the other page. Um, we had, um, and it looks like it's one of the things I left off. So yes, that's one of the things where we are about to sign the contract for that work. Um, and they, uh, we were already working on scheduling uh, preliminary investigation at three elementary <laughs> schools. Um, we need to do it. Uh, uh, they'll be able to come when school is in session, uh, one day per school, and then we'll have to shut down the power for the rest of the investigation. We're scheduling that 
one school uh, February vacation, one school in April vacation, and one school on a weekend. Um, but I don't have the exact dates yet. But that is coming. I don't have the data for you yet, I'm afraid. Thank you, because also that's, there's an example of something that when the question was asked by my colleagues earlier, mm -hmm. how are you thinking down the road mm -hmm. and what recommendations to make in the future, this like seems like one of those ones that sits in as a center point of that in which, you know, since the buildings, if we think of two buildings in particular, <laughs> Even if one of them ended up being demolished, the other one wouldn't be, right? Yeah. And so it's not a bad thing necessarily to know that your electrical systems are in good shape and what you need to do to keep the building in a state of good repair and order. But, but, but the question of what we would actually fund right. <laughs> to implement that and what burden is on the town, I mean, I, cognitively, in terms of like, who, like whose request is this? Are the schools really gonna request, quote unquote, to put in a lot of money to, you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I lay that out there, but just there's, that seems like a great example of that kind of. I agree, and I expect that we will get a long laundry list uh, from at least two schools of things that uh, should be replaced and some assistance in thinking about the costs and the priorities for those. Any other? No? Okay. okay, thank you very much. So I uh, expect that I will uh, try to follow up on some of these questions. Um, I don't know if you'll have me back. Maybe I can just send an email through Dr. Morris to, to let folks know. I think, I think that'll need to happen because this body won't meet before, JCPC will have its first meeting before this body meets again, so. Okay. And I definitely like having you guys know what it is that we're going to JCPC for ahead of time. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Okay. So now we have uh, moving on to our warrant review and vote to approve the outstanding warrants. I have handouts. <laughs> so just as he's, as Mr. Slar is doing that, um, uh, this Amherst School Committee chose to uh, look, review warrants and take a vote at a meeting. Um, and so the challenge for us is that often on warrants there's student information on there, uh, particularly as it relates to out of district placements or special education. So it's not something that we feel incredibly comfortable sending by email. And so kind of it's up to the committee whether they wanna take five, 10 minutes to review these and vote or you know, kind of more our old system, which was, um, didn't take as much time. Um, but you know, what we thought we'd do is we would provide copies for everyone on the committee, and however you want to manage it is fine with us. So if I could just orient you a little bit to what you have in front of you. So the very first, the top sheet of paper is a payroll warrant, which uh, traditionally, and I think still in place as a policy, is that the, the chair can sign that. Uh, that's the most recent one. I have a number of those for the chair to sign tonight, and we'll do signatures <coughs> after the meeting because there's a, um, a number of signatures that we need. Um, the second one is, a, is another uh, sort of uh, thing the school committee needs to do, which is in this case, it's a, it's a transfer of, of monies from, um, from a control account to the student activity account that requires actual action by you guys. Again, this could fall under a policy where a single member could, could sign and then report back to the committee. And then the following, there are three warrants um, requiring action uh, and the gory details of all the spending that's going on is in those warrants, but uh, the amounts are on the front page, and we will need uh, action by you all uh, relative to those three warrants um, and the uh, transfer of funds for the, for the uh, uh, control account to the, to the student activities account. So four motions in total. And I haven't answered any questions you have about any of that, but mostly it's a little review on your part and then appropriate series of motions. And then we'll get, I'll do signatures after the meeting. You can all, I've got a pen and <laughs> away you go. So do we wanna take, uh, Mr. Demling? Uh, just three quick notes. Uh, one, um, uh, as I've stated multiple times before, my wife is uh, an employee of the district, uh, paraprofessional uh, and the APEA union. Uh, and so I'm, I'm gonna abstain from the um, payroll warrant. Um, two, um, as we're going through this, I, I do think, even though we've discussed it before at this committee, it probably, no pun intended, warrants further discussion about how we want to uh, dispense with warrants in, of course, a legal way, but also a time-efficient way, and maybe some opportunities for improvement. 
Um, and then three, in terms of the motions, Mr. Slaughter, uh, Dr. Slaughter, um, what, what are the, um, uh, uh, is there specific language that we need for each, each individual? Motion? Not, not terrifically. I think that on the, on the first one, actually the, the payroll warrant, you don't actually have to vote that one. I think by virtue of policy you already have in place, it's just a matter of uh, making you aware of it and then the chair can sign. Um, what I would do on the, on the second one, which is the student activities accounts, I would take where it says the Wildwood principal hereby requests. I would say the school committee uh, approves the transfer of, and then the rest of that sentence should do it um, as far as a motion. And then for the others, I think the key thing is that you're approving the warrant with a date and the amount, which is on the front page. Um, at the regional school committee, I think we break it out with the, with the spending by, by sort of category. Um, it isn't really broken out that way here, and I don't think it's absolutely necessary to do that. I was going to add uh, that as opposed to at the region where there's one member reporting out, everyone, he, all the committee members here have the same information. So uh, my understanding is it leads less formality in terms of um, the vote piece um, because it's not informing the committee. Every, the committee all has the same information. Um, yeah. So that'd be the difference of why there's, um, when the committee's taking a vote, um, I think can be um, less formal than when one member's reporting out and there's not a vote taken. Ms. Bitcher. I just wanted to ask a clarifying question because I, I recall um, Mr. Mangano used to email us the warrants. So, I, I, and you earlier you said you didn't want to circulate them via email, and I just wanted some clarification on that. So, it, we've had some caution about doing that because of the student information included in warrants, and while it's not that um, we don't trust the committee about that, it's putting that out electronically has created some. FERPA pieces for us about what's being communicated electronically um, about students because generally if a student, student's name or student initials are on a warrant as it needs to be to track that, it's um, pretty identifying um, in ways that we want to protect privacy. So um, that's, I think, caused us caution. It's certainly something that we could talk about um, and I'm happy to engage with Mr. Slaughter and the chair uh, and one other member of the committee if we want to talk through that, but I, I think it's out of abundance of caution about student information that we've uh, created that, and we could certainly um, try to take the time to um, kind of um, whatever the opposite of highlight is. Um, it would be a significant amount of time for business office staff to take on, so mm -hmm. I think it's looking at our systems and how do we maintain student privacy. I'm sorry, Re Dr. Redact Schwab. is the word you're looking for. Redact, thank you. Sorry, I don't know why that one uh, was going the other way with it, but. So I'm also, I'm also reacting to the, the volume of paper and, and copies that, that we just passed around, whereas our former process, we just had one, one set that we just sort of passed down the line. And I don't know if there's a, there's a happy medium. If we had um, you know, one, one set and um, if, if we you know, start our meetings five <coughs> minutes later and to give all, each of us time to, to sort of look through the, the one central set, um, and then when we get to it, we, we just vote on it and, and sign it um, or some, some process like that just so that we're not killing this many trees. Mr. Nakajima? I want to be acknowledged twice. The first time acknowledged, I just want to say I agree we need to clean this up and we probably ought to do something like set. If we can't have them distributed in advance, we need to do something like you just mentioned, the chair mentioned, like we got to set aside 10 minutes at the beginning, be able to go through these things and then then have a cleaner vote when we get to it. I also think it'd be great, again, if we could get motion sheets attached to this so that there's a clear motion to read for each one. Yes. I move that the Amherst School Committee uh, approve the following transfer from the town master account, the school account, for the Wildwood principal in the amount of $1,200. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? No? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Yeah. Unanimous. Mr. Nakajima? I move that the Amherst School Committee approve the warrant dated 124-2020, warrant S012420, in the amount of $147,895.98. It's moved and second. Oh, I second it. Any discussion? All those in favor? Unanimous. Mr. Nakajima. I move that the Amherst School Committee approve the warrant dated January 10th, 2020, warrant S 
0110020 in the amount of $121,574.13. Is there a second? Seconded. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor? Uh, four. Sorry. All those in favor? Four. No? Abstain? Yeah. <laughs> four in favor and one abstain. Mr. Nakajima? I move that the Amherst School Committee approve the warrant dated December 27, 2019, S122719, in the amount of $44,400.04. Second. Any discussion? No? Okay. All those in favor? Four. Any against? Abstain? One. Four, zero, one. And that's it. So, we'll so just one other thing I'll just offer for as a as a piece as you think about you know whether you want a slightly different process or not is that uh, warrants need to be signed in order for us to release checks. Where that runs into an operational difficulty is over the summer when you don't meet as often. So I just I want you to right. consider that as you think ahead about ways in which you might move ahead and do this. Um, with payroll accounts, we've set it up such that the, and you voted as a committee to uh, adopt a policy where the chair can sign for those and release those without issue, but, but the other accounts payable are, are dependent upon this vote and, and signature. Okay. Sounds good. So well, we'll have a signing party at the end of this Exactly. Meeting. And okay. you can assign <laughs> the most, they get assigned four things, and okay. so you get assigned like 15 things. So anyway. we'll talk about this at the very end of the meeting when we talk about next meeting. But um, the other thing was this was a bit of catch up. We had a pretty big gap in time between our last meeting and this meeting, and we'll have to add um, another meeting in between just for this express purpose. So, um, so it won't be this many warrants each time. Yeah. So I recall that we had in the past we had had a, a 10 minute, 15 minute meeting right before a region committee. I don't know. Is that something that we should yeah. be planning as a regular basis? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Moving on to item G, the fee report. This is a discussion to review and offer feedback on FY21 fee proposals in advance of our February vote. Yep. So um, I'll start with this if that's okay. So um, this is also in the packet. One thing you'll notice is the meal price will go up, uh, or as is recommended to go up from $3 to $3.25. I think I mentioned the region that's the same in the Amher schools, that there is a lowest, you know, we have a requirement based on the price of food and participating in the uh, fruit use lunch program um, about eligible costs. And so instead of adding it up incrementally by seven or eight cents a year, uh, what we've done in the past, and that's worked, been pretty effective, is moving it up by a quarter and then waiting, having three or four years before it needs to go up again. So that is the kind of sizable increase that you see in terms of uh, lunch prices, breakfast as well. Um, but it's, it's that we plan to make this change and then have it stay unchanged for uh, consecutive years in the future. The only other thing I would add is the other, the other changes to the rates are, are in, intentionally trying to be slightly incremental, and so that you'll see the percentages are fairly small by and large, and, and the intention there is, again, to make small regular increments to those uh, to keep pace with inflation, but not to, to make a significant shift all at once on, on, uh, on folks. Any questions? No? Okay. Moving on to item H, FY21 budget presentation. And this is our first presentation. Again. And then if you put it in the folder there. Let me just give, I know the hour's late, but I think I would do want to spend two minutes to preview this. Um, 
So this is our initial budget presentation. We'll have a budget hearing next month where the um, data will be much more full. We'll have a full bullet budget book for you within two weeks. The reason we didn't have that this time around, much like last year, is since we're presenting this in advance of the governor's budget in advance of health insurance being known, those are two pretty significant variables that we'd want to have complete before a budget book is done. Both of those will be known quantities at the end of the week. Um, both the, we'll get the information from Maya, our, our insurance company, of our percentage. And we have some preliminary numbers, but the governor's budget, I think, comes out tomorrow, if I'm yeah. not incorrect. That's correct. Uh, and I'll be with the commissioner on Thursday with other superintendents where he kind of is going to bring a little more detail out to that. So uh, we'll update that information and, and send the budget book out well in advance um, and we'll come back in February with much more detail on all of these um, pieces. But this is where we're sort of sitting at the moment, and I think it's important to note that a budget is an estimate, that things change over the course of the year. We've had, we'll reference this later, we've had an um, unusual number of um, students who move into the district with significant needs, and so that's, you'll see sort of a, a loose number uh, that we'll have much more specific next time, but uh, when students move in from other districts, an IEP <coughs> meeting is held to transition them, and we have some unknown uh, Unknown dollar amounts they'll have to be assigned. Uh, folks who've been doing this a long time in the district said this is the highest number of move-ins we've had after the beginning of a, an academic year that they can recall. And so um, this is our first, first take at it, and we'll be back again in February with much more detail and, and to receive much more feedback from both the committee and the community. With that, I'll turn it over to Ms. Dr. Slaughter. All right. So I will, uh, I'll take you through a few things. There'll be a few specifics or as best we can, uh, that, that uh, the superintendent will, will probably expound upon a little bit more. Um, starting with this first slide on budget highlights, uh, as it stands now, knowing what we know or don't know, uh, engaging in our crystal ball, um, pros, proposed budget's about 2.7% uh, above what the current year is, which is kind of in keeping with what the uh, expectations from the, from the town were relative to that. Um, one thing you'll notice is, you know, zero dollars in reduction. So the 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 adjustments of three hundred eighty-three thousand is is um, other savings changes to our budget that help uh, us fit within the dollars that are available. Um, but there are no no items that are mentioned as as actual reductions or cuts in, in staff. So it's really a level services budget in the truest sense. Um, as you can see there, the proposed budget maintains uh, things we expect to have in our schools and what we've got come used to, become used to. Uh, and what you'll see in the, in the, in the new year, um, you know, as you well know, we heard it earlier tonight, the expanding dual language program, uh, curriculum sports, some, some training relative, you were talking earlier regarding, uh, you know, some of the, the kids coming with trauma and higher level needs of, uh, related to that. And so some, some supports for our paraeducators para to understand and work with those kids and work in the school uh, in and around those, those higher level needs uh, is there. Um, some preschool supports and, and some of that has to do with, with supports in, in special education and then uh, you know, reducing the educational debt in mathematics, I'm gonna let Mr. Uh, or, or, or uh, Dr. Morris talk about in, in more detail um, as far as what that is, but it's, it's a continuation of the work that's going on this year uh, relative to the changes in curriculum and then taking that forward into, into next year. Uh, just a quick little outline of, of uh, the calendar going ahead. We've got uh, tonight what we're talking about and then uh, you know, this introduction. Uh, the next public hearing in February, we, you'll see later in there that we identify the 25th of, of February, um, which you know, Dr. Morris will not be here and so we'll have to pick a different day and he'll talk about that later. Um, but then the budget adoption will, t will take place in March uh, in the, on the 17th, and the reason for that is to hit the deadlines that the town has relative to its uh, you know, budgeting process through April, May, and, and by the end of June. Um, and this parallels strongly with, with the regional schools and what they have to do. Um, they'll also, you know, you'll also vote that budget in, in March as well, and so that's to meet some deadlines for town meetings and the other, other communities. Um, so as you may all know or not, I'll just touch base quickly on the budget process. We start in October to December and start sort of shaping things as, as best we can. For the last couple of months, we've been uh, getting a little more specific uh, and, and you know, getting a sense of you know, what are the things we need to do and what's the, the dollars really start to look like. Um, get the mouse out of the way. Um, and again, we continue you know, these meetings with, with school-based personnel and, and other groups uh, to get information out to folks. Uh, I believe Mr. Mangano met with the, the CPAC and with the LPAC groups uh, just to, to sort of uh, frame the conversation, the budget with them. Um, 
that next to last bullet point about the budget hearing is for the 25th. It will not be the 25th. It will be some other to, do, to be determined date. And then, of course, we'll, we'll come back on the 17th to vote uh, in March. But that, that outlines a little bit of sort of the arc of work that we do and, and the <coughs> give and take that goes on over the course of the months from October through, through March. Um, this is a quick snapshot of where we're at right now relative to our expense budget. Um, you know, the salary increases, uh, you know, the expectations around substitutes is that, you know, the minimum wage has gone up this year. Um, that has a cascading effect. Um, some of our substitutes operate right at that, that uh, the bound of our, our um, minimum wage. Um, you know, technically we're not required to meet that. Uh, municipalities and, and schools are, are uh, absolved from having to do that, but we, you guys have a policy, and, and I think rightly so, and the town does as well, to, to you know, uh, provide at least the minimum wage, and so that has a cascading effect on our substitute uh, costs, and so that will be an impact there. Uh, the salaries are mostly around uh, steps and colas, uh, as they generally al always are, um, and other expense accounts are anticipated uh, uh, costs that we have going on. And so if you take that level of service, it's about a 4% increase off the base. Um, we have additions and reductions, and I'll, I'll let the superintendent talk to those in a bit more detail. But as you see there at the bottom of the chart, about 2.7, 2.8% is kind of right in the neighborhood of, of what we're looking at for an increase in the budget from last year to this year. Um, I think I mentioned this in salaries. We have all our collective bargaining are in, in place. 2% is the COLA for everybody. The only uh, collective bargaining group that is not and they're getting ready to start negotiations literally tomorrow, is our food service uh, group. Um, I've already mentioned the substitutes. Uh, and then there's a couple items there relative to, to expense accounts. Our health insurance, we projected at 6%. We're hoping that the, that, that will be the case. Um, you know, we're actually hopeful it might be a little less. Uh, you know, one of the reasons for changing health insurance, insurance structure was to help mitigate that. But even at 6%, it's a pretty, that's a pretty, for health insurance, that's a fairly modest uh, increase, but it still contributes, as I, as I note here, it's about a third of the increase in expenses uh, that we have is, is related to a 6% increase in health insurance. That's how big a piece of the pie it is. Um, so I just wanted to note that for you. Um, our next slide is additions and reductions, and so I think I'll let the superintendent sort of take that on unless there's questions up to, to this point. Mr. Demling. Yeah. I'm sorry for the interruption, uh, but by policy, um, yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, move to extend our uh, scheduled ending meeting time to 10.05. I'm sorry, to 9.35. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Uh, uh, all those in favor? Three. Uh, against? <laughs> Abstain? Do you like a, a I would recess? like a bathroom break. Yeah. <laughs> Move to recess for our, um, recess for five minutes, two minutes. Yep. Okay. So. <laughs> Thank you.
Please continue. So, <laughs> back to where we were, which was about additions and reductions, and so I'm gonna to defer to the superintendent to sort of paint the picture here a little bit for you and go through those in a bit more uh, detail as he sees fit. Yep, and I'll be brief, uh, partially because it's late, but partially because this is the first cut and not all these things are fully defined yet. This is uh, where we are uh, on January 21st. So, uh, well, it looks like we'll have one fewer classroom than we did last year. That's just based on how many sixth grade classrooms we have and how many kindergarten classes we're expecting. Um, we did not have any sabbatical requests this year, so we did have one sabbatical last year, so that uh, we do budget for that, and so that comes off. Uh, we did have a stabilization fund contribution uh, that, that was for special education stabilization that we've funded that, we being the district, has funded that twice now. We feel like there's $150,000 in that stabilization fund and that's an, a sufficient amount to not continue to add to. Uh, we feel like we'll be in a position to prepay retirement incentives, which will help our budget. Uh, this shift school committee stipend payments to the town so that um, it's a shell game because we'll get less funding from the town, but we wanted to publicly show that um, the funding as per the town charter that school committee members receive, uh, that budget line will be shifted to the town account so it won't be in the school's budget and hence it looks like there's a sixteen thousand dollar adjustment but it won't really be realized because the town will then take that off on what gets appropriated for the schools um, but we didn't want to someone might ask where is that line it used to be there so we want to be very public and transparent about that um, alternative funding source is something i'll get into much more detail in february about uh, math curricula implementation, so that is the position that was assisting 6th through 12th grade uh, new curricula implementation. And uh, for our 6th grade, we feel very uh, confident that uh, that support's been incredibly valuable and our 6th grade teachers will be ready to run without that support going into next year. And a preschool is a small dollar amount, but we are looking at shifting some of the models of leadership and support um, based on some of the feedback, you know, even that you've, you've heard in the past and was reflected in the report tonight. We'll come back with a lot more detail because it's, it's, it's not so much the financial amount that will be changed, but it is a, a structural change that we're considering for the preschool program. For additions, we're uh, requesting $5,000 for an MSBA steering group. This was loosely talked about in the last meeting, got a lot of feedback from the staff meetings we had uh, around MSBA of having a steering committee of teachers who wouldn't have to fully commit to being on the building committee, but could be a second source of information, feedback, and support for the building committee moving forward, and uh, we would stipend staff members to participate in that. There was some really positive feedback received from staff on that idea, and particularly having an expectation that they when, would be the resources in the schools for other staff members, um, there's only so many places myself and, and you all can be that there's a regular communication between the larger staff and who better to do it than staff members in our three schools. Um, so that's not my idea. It came from a staff member, but I'm stealing it. I told her I was going to steal it and, and say it publicly because I think it makes a lot of sense around communication. Uh, there's a recurrent request um, to, um, based on the end of the Great Span Advisory Group to have a group look at sixth grade to the middle school and to concretize a plan over the summer months for the consideration of the community. That's based on the work of the grade span advisory, the feedback we received this spring, uh, taking that, which is again what I would call sort of a 10,000 foot level and getting down to the ground on something that people can respond to that's specific uh, more than where we are right now. And that was by design. That's no critique of the grade span advisory, but uh, folks have to be compensated for working in the summer as they should be. Um, the next one, again, I'll come back in February with a lot more detail, but uh, one of the topics at the regional level, as you all know, that's come up is what is the participation of underrepresented groups in honors and AP classes, uh, particularly in mathematics. And the more conversations I have with staff, the more I'm in the belief that we have to think about what we're doing at the elementary level, um, and particularly uh, on the heels of middle school. So there's a whole lot you could do instructionally, but what are we doing? Um, that's dynamic, that promotes students who, uh, for whatever reason, have been underrepresented in those classes to have full access. And so there's some content pieces, but there's also some um, kind of uh, motivational pieces that we want to put into place. Again, more specifics to come, but uh, I'm convinced that uh, if we're only looking at it as a seven through 12 issue, we're really missing the boat. Uh, second to last one, paraeducator training came up tonight and it's come up multiple times. We are doing more training. I was uh, around trauma and trauma-informed practice and 
the staff members that uh, we experience being on the front lines of that who need more support and training, frankly, because our contract, you know, doesn't have things like as much staff meeting and professional development. Our paraeducators, uh, we've done that last month. There was a training for all staff at the preschool level. Sort of interestingly, I was in a meeting with preschool staff in November, and um, I said, can you raise your hand if you've had trauma-based training? And we did have a fair number of people, and they were exclusively at that point in time, and that's been, you know, that the hands would be different now, but it was professional staff and counseling staff or um, kind of ABA um, behavior specialists with that training and the paraeducators all had their hands down and they are the ones working most closely with students in need. So what we're recognizing is we need to build in financial support um, so that paraeducators can receive training they need. It's also tends to be a more transient element of our workforce. Um, so our, our turnover rate of paraeducators, and this is not specific to Amherst, this is across um, <laughs> schools in general, tends to be higher, and so we need to build in a more routine level. This is, so in other words, this isn't like a one-stop gap, hey, we need this training. It's actually we need to build a, a practice and a structure for paraeducators over time, knowing that you know, a good 20 to 30% of our paraeducators moves on to other, other careers. Some of them stay with us and become teachers. Some of them move on to other places. Um, but it's trying to earmark a dollar amount to support that structure. And the last one I alluded to earlier, which is contingency control accounts. Again, we have a number of new students to our district, and as they're coming, we're developing their IEPs, and by the time we get together in late February, we'll have much more clarity on what that number uh, really looks like. Uh, but at this point, we put built in about $50,000, um, not knowing exactly whether it's staffing or placements that we'll have to be considering. And as you can see, um, thankfully, um, it's not, doesn't, this doesn't happen very often to me in my, my time in the district. Um, we do not have any listed reductions. Turn it back to, well, why don't we pause for questions before we turn it back to Dr. Slaughter, actually, or comments if there are any. Any questions at this point? Mr. Demling? Um, so I'm probably not the only one who's understandably naturally curious about alternative funding source. Um, not because of the hour, but because uh, I'm, I'm guessing you have appropriate um, district good reasons for not elaborating on that at the moment. Um, I'm okay with that, but if, you know, if there's anything else you want to share, great. If not, I'll, I will look forward to February. That, that should be an interesting discussion. Um, what was the other thing? Um, so I just want, because we're in additions and reductions at, at this level of money, you know, one, one thing I've been thinking about in general in terms of when I was reviewing the budget and the money that goes out, you know, we've spoken about charter school tuition funding um, and the, the impact of those millions of dollars that come out of our district ad nauseum. Um, and, um, you know, so, and so I think about how to prevent some of that uh, loss, uh, you know, which is if we lose one kid at, uh, for seven years can be, you know, it's a six figure, easily a six figure plus uh, cost. Um, and and what, what resources prospective families have when they evaluate their options for, for schools. And, um, I, th I think our website does a great job uh, in terms of a number of functions. It's, it's maybe not the best in terms of showcasing, uh, dare I say, marketing to prospective families in terms of everything that we have to offer. There's been so many examples. I've lost track of things that I've seen uh, presented here and, and, and in other district meetings uh, about amazing things going on that are just um, not on the top of everyone's mind, you know, in terms of the resources we have and the cont we continue to have while we're still at a relatively manageable percentage of our um, tuition going out to charter. So um, there could be a smaller dollar investment possibly for some kind of a, a, a website that, um, and even if it over the years retained one, one student, um, it would sort of pay for itself. So I don't know if you've thought about those kinds of things or those kinds of advance return on investment um, opportunity. Yeah, I have, and I think we're, um, we're in the midst of creating a separate site that's exclusively for, we actually had a meeting about this morning, for prospective families because um, one of the challenges that all public school districts have is they have to catalog a tremendous amount of information that uh, very little of which is particularly interesting for the vast majority of prospective families, right? It's just, that's just our challenge, right? If we're, if we're a private school and really the focus was on recruitment, 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 we could have like, the, I've looked at one private school in the area's website, it's beautiful, right? And, and you can't find much information if I was a current student or parent, but that seems to not be the focus of that school. And, and that's not, we're public school, we don't have that flexibility, so to speak. So we are in the process of creating, I think in the next two months, you'll see a prototype of um, something that you could link from our website, but is a distinct website 
with a very different focus. I mean, if you think also, uh, like uh, our prototype for it essentially is the MSBA site, which I know all of you have been on, which looks functionally different. Uh, it's, not, it's not attending to prospective families, but it's a distinct site that um, one can get to from our website easily, but um, doesn't try to emulate the cataloging feature uh, that our current website has. It's much more about um, promoting all the wonderful things our staff do. So I think that's something we're going to attempt to do locally and I, without a cost, and I think we have the capacity to be able to do that. Any other? Mr. Nakajima. I don't, know the, I don't know the right time to bring this up, so I'm just going to mention it quickly now. Um, I think at some point this spring or summer, we need to revisit our budget calendar and process um, because um, I think this year, um, because the school committee turned over uh, and there were elections and it sort of just framed how the fall was executed administratively or I mean, in terms of this body, um, we didn't really, if you look back a year ago, we organized our budget process differently in ways that substantively engaged in this process as early as like October. Um, and even though a lot of the information was thin because you're just going through your processes, you describe it, it just, it gave more bites at the apple an opportunity for the committee to get familiarized with what we're, what, where the budget's at, what the trends are, what we're learning, what the town guidance is and all that kind of stuff. And so I'm just, saying out loud that it, and it's not anyone's fault but i'm just saying out loud that this process from where we are today to where we're going to be to the point we vote on the budget feels by comparison very sort of cognitively rushed which is probably only compounded by the hour of the evening <laughs> so i'm just saying that out loud because i think as as the chair is planning with you dr morris you're both planning our next coming meetings <laughs> Anything you can do to think about ways to ins insert conversations we should be having mm -hmm. or presentations we should be having, I think would be welcome not only for us but actually for the public probably as well. And then at some point after that, we should, we should probably talk about how we want to do next year and then on top of that, how we should handle the election years yeah. so that we can give advice forward going on how to do that better. Dr. So, so I agree with uh, Mr. Nakajima's feedback and comments, and I think the other thing that I'd like to, if we're going to have a conversation about budget process in the future, um, I would really enjoy having this meeting, uh, like the, the, the type of presentation you see now, even if it meant having two meetings in February or doing something different after the governor's budget come out and after we have health insurance information, it feels really odd that tomorrow afternoon we could have different information and by Friday we could have really different information like, like within 72 hours of, of talking about this feels really odd. At the region, there's sort of no way to avoid it because of the structure of the four towns, uh, much to sort of my chagrin, because I really would prefer not to put out budget information that has the potential to change pretty dramatically uh, and if it's avoidable. I mean, I look at my colleague in Northampton and their budget schedule, which granted they're under a different town charter, they've laid our process, and, and they're not having, they're having the types of dialogue that Mr. Nakajima described in December and January, because the this part's not coming out till February, and it affords a lot more time for dialogue in the front end. So because we do have more flexibility with the Amherst budget than we do at the regional level, um, I think that'd be something that as we move forward, um, I'd enjoy a conversation about. Okay. Um, I think Mr. Slaughter just uh, can breeze through the last couple um, slides because I, I am conscious of the hour. Yes, absolutely. So, and, and these, again, given the, the, the nature of what uh, the superintendent just said, these, these trend you know, charts are, are really uh, not truly indicative of what, what's likely to happen. Um, matter of fact, I was looking at this one in particular today, and it, it struck me that it was a fairly steep increase. Surprisingly so, and so I was looking at that, and there's one school in particular out of the three, I won't name names, but that was significantly driving this, and so that begs a, a series of questions, and so I, I will in, investigate that a little more deeply, but, um, and the, when you look at the projected for 22 and 23, those are, you know, sort of base percentages there, so they just, it compounds, uh, which if you're trying to save money is a great thing, but not so much when you're trying to uh, mitigate your spending. Uh, but nonetheless, this, this is a bit of an aberration as far as, I think, showing how significantly it, it would go up for next year. 
Can I ask um, a good question? Is yeah, that? absolutely. So this says regular education classroom instruction spending. How do I link that back to the the table on the previous page where it's salary? Is this all salaries for instruction spending, or is it a combination of salaries and and expenses? Other? It's both. It's it's predominantly salaries, but it's not exclusively so. Um, and so as we go into the next slide, which is uh, English language learning spending, this is own category of stuff. You'll notice the, the numbers on the uh, left are, are a much smaller number, obviously. Um, and that seems to drop off. And that's actually you know, uh, largely driven by some staff turnover. Um, and so although we're investing into this area pretty significantly <coughs> and, and you know, sort of holding steady with some of the staffing we have, just by virtue of the changes and how we predict those changes uh, is, is causing that sort of uh, leveling of, 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 uh, of spending in that area. Um, special education preschool spending, you know, fairly modest uh, incline there. Um, insurance and benefits, again, you know, we put 6% on the chart. It doesn't have this crazy spike. If you looked at ones from other years where we had, uh, you know, more significant swings in, in insurance costs, it would be more noticeable. Um, but that should, and the goal of, of changing insurance is, is to have that be more level like that. Um, in this area, uh, around grant summary and revolving funds, I think the really critical one to look at here, uh, most, of, most things are staying the same or are expected to stay without change or very little change. The one change is around school choice, uh, using more school choice funds to help our budget. Um, we have a revolving fund which holds the, the receipts that we receive for the school choice kids that we bring in in-house. And so um, you want to hold a, a certain amount of that, but not so much that uh, you're not benefiting the, the kids today. And so the idea with a, with a larger increase in, in use of school choice funds is that we'll still be able to maintain a healthy balance in the revolving fund, but yet use that money to help support our kids uh, kind of across the board. Um, one other thing that comes up is, is uh, you know, sort of you know how how many and and to what extent are kids uh, leaving our district for uh, other options in in charter and choice um, and what we see here and it's a little hard to tell in some respects we're the dashed line there uh, and it's across all four towns in the region so it's a little it's not just Amherst in this regard uh, but we've had a real flattening of, of what we're having so we're sort of staying in a steady state um, you know, it's good and bad. We don't get a lot of additional state aid because it's about the difference in, in uh, kids that you have. But we're holding pretty steady. You still see some schools like East Hampton, uh, Belchertown, they're still having growth in, in this area. And so they're getting more and more of their, their resources sort of pulled out to, to fund those charter and choice uh, choices that kids are making. Um, one of the big decisions you'll need to make over the you know, in, in ensuing uh, months is, is, is about school choice and whether or not to um, continuous school choice, how much, what kind, that sort of thing. I didn't know if you wanted to add some specific things relative to that. This is sort of the mechanics of how it works, and and so I I, I don't know if uh, uh, Dr. Morris wants to weigh in on this a little bit. Uh, and the school choice hearing is next month, and, and we'll talk more about that. I, we're not seeing a lot of grade levels with spaces for school choice for next year, um, and, and so um, I think we'll be able to share that more specifically at the school choice hearing that's that'll happen in February. But if you could scroll, go forward two slides. Right. Yeah, right there. So when Mr. Slaughter is talking about evening out, um, increasing the amount of choice revenue we're spending, so the green line is the fund balance, the blue line is the expenditures, and the red line or the orange peach line is the revenues. And so our balance uh, has gotten to the point where we feel like it's, it's in really good shape. And so we're trying to even out those um, purple line and the orange line. Our experience in Pelham is you really don't want to go too far below that, even when you think you have a healthy balance, because then you create a structural imbalance in your budget. It's also the case that we don't know exactly how things are going to play out with the building project and how that's going to affect our ability to take choice and choice seats. So we're being pretty conservative and, and not wanting to, it's tempting to say we have that much money, we should be spending more, except then you create the structural deficit. And what we experience in Pelham, and, and I We've talked about this in public meetings in Palm. I know it's a different committee, but I think the same thing's true. Um, that's a really small, I mean, it's, it's probably 15% the size of the Amherst Public Schools. 
uh, they had a balance over half a million dollars, and, and now it's, a, it's, it's dipped you know, right near 300000 and a little below, and it's getting to the point around sustainability where that's why Pelham's questioning <coughs> those pieces. So I think it's easy to say, oh, we, you know, you've got the reserve there, and you have the reserve there for a good reason, because you may not, we may not maintain the same level of a choice in the future, and we want to be really cautious about our use. So we feel like we are at, finally at a place where we do want to increase our use because we don't want to build too big a balance and just have it sitting there. But we, we don't want to go much beyond where we're, where we're, how we're using it right now. Um, so I think primarily what you'll hear um, next time is, is pretty limited use uh, recommendation around choice uh, for perhaps one, you know, no more than two grade levels uh, as we look to next year. I think that's it. And that's it. Is any other questions that you might have, I'm happy to answer those. And questions? Come. Um, Ms. Spitzer? I guess I just want to go back to the slide um, with the, um, sorry, the budget trend slide, regular education classroom instruction spending. So was that primarily just based on the COLA increases and the uh, wage so there's, the, there's the increase in the minimum wage. Would like the substitute salaries be in that piece too? Um, I'm trying to recall. <laughs> uh, I want to say no, but it might be. I don't think so. I think it's largely, um, uh, again, it's largely salaries. And so it is, you know, sort of steps and COLA's primary driver in regard, this regard. There are some uh, other, you know, educational expenses. Most of those we fairly flat fund, so they don't have a strong impact on the overall budget. Um, but what was really odd to me was that it, it to be perfectly honest, the, the sort of uh, staffing cost was projected to go slightly down or stay flat, essentially, in two of the schools, but one of the schools had a pretty significant increase. And so I just haven't dug into why that's showing up that way. And it may just be a quirk of, you know, who is at a given building. Um, you know, it could really be, oh, this particular building's hired some fairly new staff. They're all getting steps and colas. They're all, you know, sort of mid-salary scale. And so that's, you know, when you do a step and a cola, it's a pretty significant chunk. And if you have, you know, 10 people out of your 30, professional staff or whatever, you know, the, those are sort of profound differences in, in the structure of, of the school and how it impacts the, the budget. Um, I think, you know, I would discount looking at 22 and 23 on this um, because I think it's just a sort of compounding of that rather large increase that's showing there in, in, in the 20 to 21. But, but uh, I'll definitely get some, some more detail on that. And again, it might, as we look at it more closely and get a little better information, we'll probably moderate that a little bit. Anything else? No? Okay. Thank you. Um, and now our final item before moving on to the, uh, of our continuing business is MSBA update, discussion. Mr. Demling. You have motion? to do it again. <laughs> We're obligated. Yes, thank you. Uh, per the requirement of our policy, I move to extend the scheduled end of our, end of our meeting from 9.35, a half an hour to 10.05. A second. 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 All those in favor? Four. Uh, against? One. Passes. We'll continue. So I'll be brief. Um, <laughs> Please. <laughs> is that uh, MSB update, um, just there was a, a discussion last about what feedback should be shared with the town manager and town council on the selection, um, not of individuals on the school building committee, but on the school building committee composition. So uh, one thing I did is I attached, um, not that I'm suggesting that's the template exactly that anyone should follow, but the previous school building committee to the back of the agenda. And I also reached out to the Wildwood School Building Committee, the prior school building committee, to get their feedback. Um, I got three responses, and I'll just summarize that for you um, tonight. So <laughs> one response focused that the school building committee should not be put in the position of making decision that might be construed as political or a decision that should be made by, by the town via its elected representatives or public vote. For instance, grade level span, um, one or two schools. Um, that, that this individual felt like that should be made by elected officials, not appointed officials. Um, and um, so just creating a really clear boundary and expectation for who is on a school building committee and what the role is, which I am working with the charge of Mr. Bachman. Um, 
The second piece of information was that, and this is um, feedback I heard from multiple people um, during the process and right after, is that the needs to be a reasonable size and the perception of many on the prior school building project was that the last school building, building committee felt a bit too big. Um, and um, I think the last, I'm summarizing, I certainly could share the, the exact uh, language, but the last one also talked about um, making sure that individuals are comfortable communicating and being comfortable um, providing uh, community outreach events and publications that a part of being on the building committee is communicating with others and that should be a core expectation of someone who joins not just that they show up at meetings and do the work in between but they also can communicate with different constituents in town so those were the themes that I heard and that's all I have to share tonight questions or comments Ms. Spitzer I just want to clarify that um, you interviewed three people out of the 20 who were on the school building committee. So, and I, it just seems like um, it would be a stretch to call them themes necessary. It's, it's a good summary, but I'm, I'm wondering if you, I mean, especially given the first one, suggesting that we take away pretty big decisions from the, the scope of the school building um, committee, it seems like we'd want to know whether or not there was broader support for that kind of. So I reached out to everyone who was on the building committee who I had contact information for, which was almost everyone, but not quite everyone. And I can't compel responses, no, you know? No, no. So I think it's a point well taken about themes. It was the themes of the responses that I received. The size was definitely a theme that I came up throughout the, I mean, that, that one I feel confident in saying was uh, I did, we did gather with a group after the building project had failed. I think I reported back on this, and this is a couple years ago, but I believe before you were on the committee. Um, and, and there was some thoughts around the size being a bit too large. Um, but I, I can only report what people shared with me, and, and I'm not suggesting that this committee needs to agree with anything I shared, but I just figured that was reasonable homework to be done. Mr. Nakajima? So um, this certainly looks like a lot of people, so I could understand the argument that it should be a smaller number and also, and this, this echoes a theme that we've talked about in the past, um, looking at alternative mechanisms of engaging different stakeholder constituencies so that the, 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 the circumstance isn't set up as being binary, that either you have an absolutely massive school building committee that involves everyone you can think of or every stakeholder you can think of, or you don't have them and that means they're completely excluded or unduly excluded except for sort of like, you know, broad public forums or something. So that totally makes sense. Uh, I have a sort of a funny question. And again, because I missed the discussion in the last meeting, I may be missing something. What are you looking for out of this conversation or what is the committee looking for out of this conversation? Like what, what guidance are you looking for from us? So the, I'm going to see if I summarize accurately our last meeting, but your colleagues can certainly correct me. So there was a discussion about the school committee wanting to have some input since this decision is, ends up being recommended by the town manager and approved by the town council, um, that there, there was a thought that the school committee should have some opinions to share with either the town manager or the council or both uh, about composition of the building committee. Um, so. I'm in the role of providing information. Um, I think town manager is encouraging me to be part of or somehow connected to the interview process. I don't know what that looks like yet, um, but we talked about that to town council in January, uh, earlier in January when we went. And so um, it's really for if the committee would like to um, either take a position or assign someone to um, gather feedback and, and come uh, and share that with um, the town council, I think it's, it's really whatever role you'd like, the committee would like to play. Sorry for not saying the beginning. My apologies. Mr. Denley? Yeah, I, I, so that was my general recollection as well. Um, when I was at the meeting where Dr. Morris and the town manager presented this to the town council, the town manager mentioned that as they're kicking off drafting the charge and, and interviewing for the committee, they would value and welcome the school committee's feedback. And I think some of the town council were also like, well, this is their first rod rodeo in terms of trying to construct a workable building committee. and so. You know, lessons learned from past experience would be would be helpful. Um, so I don't know if it was the same people, but I mean, over the last couple of years, I've probably spoken to half the previous building committee, and uh, and I, I reach out to a, a few of them um, recently. You know, so I heard some of the same feedback. Um, I, I heard a lot of uh, the fact that this is a massive time commitment, <laughs> uh, 
And so, and just in terms of what should the composition be and what focus should there be in terms of uh, interviewing and selection, emphasizing that point um, that this is really something that you are committing a, a, a lot of your life to is, is pretty important. Um, you know, in, in terms of, you know, what will you support, what won't you support, I, I, I do think that, um, you know, it's, it's a bit of a tricky thing to, to say. On the, on the one hand, it seems a bit draconian to say, you know, come into the interview room and do you support the one building or not? <laughs> um, on the other hand, uh, we've talked at very much length uh, here about the uh, superintendent has said, you know, that he doesn't see a solution past five or seven years for, um, for, for to, you know, to, to do two MSBA projects in a row. Um, so I think at least sort of getting a, a gauge on whether there is openness and support to the solution that's already been, uh, you know, so, uh, part of the statement of interest, I think would be helpful. Um, one, one specific bit of feedback I got from an educator was that um, the, in his experience, the educational vision really uh, drove the building design. And so getting teacher input, um, multiple teacher input from both Fort River and Wildwood, um, especially from staff that could speak to the specific programming that's going on in those schools, so like the dual language program, the project-based learning focus that's emerging, um, would, be, would be pretty important because that's, that's going to drive that, um, as well as teachers and or <coughs> staff involved in the uh, three specialized special ed programs. So, you know, the, the more things you talk about, you know, now we're up bumping up against the other principle of trying to keep the committee smaller, um, so that, that is a challenge, but um, that was one big theme about having that really strong teacher educator view. And the other um, theme uh, that I, I've, I've heard pretty consistently is having people that are just experienced with designing and building things in a process and knowing that if you make a certain decision at a certain point, what ramifications it has later on, uh, if you've never been through that, that can be a learning experience. And so if that aspect of it is not a learning experience, that can be very valuable. So, um, you know, not any one person has, has all, all these skills, but if there are, you know, if there's a parent or a staff member or a teacher that has some of those skills, I think that could be, that would be valuable. I think the one one thing that I would personally add is is um, echoing the one of the th uh, themes or ideas that you heard from your conversations is that it's really important to have somebody. It's not outlined as sort of one of the MSBA requirements of the committee, but I do think that having somebody that can. Um, having people on within the building committee that have experience and have expertise in sort of outreach and, and um, uh, engagement is going to be really, really important. I and mean, that's one of the biggest lessons that we learned in the first project. So um, it's not specified, but I think that that should be a criteria for at least one member of the of the committee. Did you have something to add? Hey. Oh, Dr. Morris. So my process suggestion to use or lose would be perhaps if there's two members of the committee that want to draft up some kind of themes or bulleted points for the committee to review yeah. in February, because I think it's still the timeline should still work. Um, um, that might kind of engender more dialogue and, and be a, an active next step in this process. Sounds good. Any volunteers? I, I can, I'd be happy to draft the bullets with input from others. Ben? Mr. Harrington, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> And, it, and, it, and I can either be as involved or not involved as, as you both want. I'll leave it to you to make that determination. I'm happy to meet with you. Happy for you all just to work on this on, uh, without my presence, whatever, whatever you'd like. Okay. Sounds good. Any other thoughts? No? Okay. Um, so we'll move on to accepting. We don't have uh, agenda planning on here. I don't know. On, it's not on the agenda to agenda plan future meetings. <laughs> right, so decisions so. can be made, but I can, in the lieu of not having a chair to walk into this meeting, I can just give a quick update on things to look for, and then you and I can get together to more fully do that. But we can do the gifts first if you'd like. Okay. Done. Yep, can I make so. a motion? <laughs> yep. Um, I move to accept the following donations um, from Alliance Energy LLC number 28072 to support Wildwood Elementary Math Science and the amount of $500. Is there a second? Second. Second. Any questions? All those in favor? 
It's unanimous, five. And I think we're on to our last. Yeah. I'll just mention that I, I think you'll get an email tomorrow. We're hoping to uh, have a meeting next Monday before the regional meeting um, just to do um, two th three things. Warrant review, because uh, there will be another warrant ready. Uh, we can try to figure out how to streamline that process as compared to tonight um, to identify two JCPC reps. And um, I think there's actually two gifts that are rather timely that didn't get on for tonight. Um, uh, but I think that's a 15, 20 minute meeting. Uh, for the February meeting, I'll work with the chair to have an alternate date because the 25th won't work. Um, but we'll have our budget hearing, uh, capital plan, we'll come back with that even though um, JCP is will have formed. Uh, we'll, we're planning to have the Wildwood School Improvement Plan update for you all, um, second quarter budget, fee vote, uh, let's see, um, school choice forum, warrant review, uh, and if there's in this MSBA topic. Um, just getting a little head, just to give you the committee a heads up, we're planning for food services and a garden program to do a joint presentation in March. Also coming back with report cards um, for that as well. If this is not on the agenda, that's probably where we should leave it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Do we have a motion? I move to adjourn. Second. It's not for discussion, so all those in favor? <laughs> It's unanimous. Thank you all. <laughs> and, uh,